Welcome everyone to GSMA EMF Forum 2022. Uh, I'm Jack Crowley. I'll be your overall coordinator for the day. Uh, and I lead the GSMA activities on, on EMF and health concerns. We have quite a group of people here in the room. We also have significantly more people online. This is our first hybrid format event for EMF. So it'll be interesting to see how it operates. Just a few housekeeping issues in case of fire. Evacuate the building by the closest exit and disperse. There's no particular location nearby to congregate at. There are bathrooms just outside the door or over near the elevators where you came up if you're looking for them. You'll also find QR codes on your desks. Uh, we've tried to keep this as paperless as possible so you can access the event program booklet uh, and a couple of other items that I'll mention as we go through the day. For those of you who are online, please, as you, we go through the day, do submit your questions through the, the chat function on the software. And I'll start off by welcoming our, our first speaker, uh, Daniel Pataki, Vice President, Policy and Regulation, and Head of Europe at GSMA, to give the formal welcome for the event. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person. It's just a, a very busy period for, for regulation and policy. I, I'm in Brussels. I'm I'm in a hotel, so I hope the, the coverage is okay and, and you can hear me and you can see me. Just a couple of, of words of introduction for me. Thank you, Jack. So after the two years of successful online events, this year we adopt the hybrid model, as Jack said, for GSMA EMF Forum. We hope that this approach maintains the wider access of our successful online events and also recaptures the informal discussions that was a valued feature of our previous in-person only forums. This is also the first time that the in-person EMF forum has been held in London, so I hope you enjoy our facilities there. We welcome everyone joining us today, whether in person or online. The theme for this year is the future of EMF policy harmonization. We see this year as being a key transition to more globally harmonized EMF policies. In this year, the updated international EMF guidelines for ICNERP were published. These have been already adopted by some countries in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Furthermore, the European Commission is seeking expert advice on making the updated international EMF guidelines the basis for EMF protection policy for both workers and the public. You will hear from one of the experts involved in this work in our EMF science panel. The European Commission is also supporting four large EMF research groups with 29 million euros of funding over five years. In parallel with the Commission activities, the World Health Organization is preparing an updated risk assessment for radio signals. The last time this was done was in 93, and you won't find any mention of mobile phones in the report. We look forward to learning more about the status of that activity from the leader of the WHO International EMF project today. This year, the International Technical Standards Organization, the EIC and ITU have been busy. The EIC has provided updated methods for assessing compliance of 5G base stations and mobile devices, including for the higher frequencies. Some countries have already adopted these techniques, which improve the accuracy of assessment. The GSME encourages countries to update their own compliance rules. As the global economy recovers from COVID-19 and faces threats both short and long term, mobile technology must be able to deliver to its full capability. Operators' investment in network infrastructure over the last decade have helped to shrink the coverage gap for mobile broadband networks from a third of the global population to just 6%. Last year, mobile technologies are generated about 5% of GDP globally. 5G adoption continues to grow rapidly in pioneer markets, with the total number of connections set to reach 1 billion by the end of this year. Maximizing the potential of mobile technologies means getting the policy setting right. Our second panel will be an opportunity here for policymakers and others about policy approaches to setting EMF limits, approving antennas, and communicating with the public. We will all be aware of the attacks on the telecommunication infrastructure in 2020 due to false claims linking 5G to COVID-19. Strong responses by governments and others have reduced, but not eliminated 5G misinformation. In January 2022, a survey of 12,000 people from Germany, Ireland, Italy, Norway, Poland, and the UK found that 14% of people think that there's a link between COVID-19 symptoms and 5G. Clearly, all trusted stakeholders need to continue communicating the scientific facts. One of the topics where we continue to see misinformation is the use of millimeter wave frequencies for 5G. Today, we are launching a GSMA guide to 5G millimeter wave safety. 
The reality is that millimeter wave frequencies are not new and have been used for decades in satellite and other communication networks. National and international safety guidelines for radio waves apply to all frequencies used for 5G, including 5G millimeter wave. We also highlight the importance of regulators preparing for possible interest during forthcoming millimeter wave spectrum licensing. As I noted at the outset, in the near future, we will have updated scientific risk assessment, updated limits, and updated methods assess EMF exposures. Therefore, we see this is a period of transition for EMF policy, and now is the time for governments to prepare for the adoption of an international harmonized approach. Most countries are already in the starting blocks with policies based on the ICNRP 98 guidelines. However, there are a handful of countries in Europe and some countries in Asia that have more restrictive rules. The international health experts tell us that there is no additional health protection from restrictive EMF limits. Measurements show that EMF limits are not lower in countries with restrictive limits. Restrictive EMF limits stop full site capacity being used, which often means that more antennas are needed and the restrictions negatively impact the quality of coverage, especially indoors. The GSMA agrees with the ITU conclusion, adopting ICNRP 2020 limits represents best practice for governments. I want to take this opportunity also to thank the steering group members from the GSMA EMF and Health Working Group and the supporting GSMA staff, especially Jack, for the hard work preparing for today. We also thank the speakers for agreeing to share their expertise and insights. A goal of every GSMA EMF forum has been to contribute to improved understanding and sharing of good practices. I know that you will find the discussions informative as usual, and I wish you a successful day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for, the, for those opening remarks. Before we move into the, the first formal session of the day uh, and introduce Nadia, who will be uh, introducing the first set of speakers, just to emphasize again, the QR code on your desk allows you to access the event booklet where they have the full bios of the speakers, so we'll just do brief introductions. Uh, for those of you who are online, please submit your questions as we go through. The first two speakers won't be taking questions during the presentations. We'll take those questions during the, the science panel discussion. So now uh, let's start the meeting with the uh, scientific perspective. Let's introduce Dr. Emily van Deventer, who is going to talk about the status of WHO EMF risk assessment process. Dr. Emily van Deventer is the head of the Radiation and Health Unit at the World Health Organization in Geneva, in Switzerland, and she joined WHO in 2000. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be able to discuss with you the status of the WHO radio frequency electromagnetic field risk assessment process and to be again talking to GSMA EMF forum. Today, I am unable to be with you in London, but I will be discussing throughout this presentation the activity on radio frequency fields and the approach that we have taken on assessing the risks from radio frequency fields. First of all, a few words in terms of the organization that I am part of, the World Health Organization, which was established in 1948. And I think it needs no introduction to you, especially after this couple of years of a pandemic. But just to reiterate, the function that we have is to act in the United Nations system as the coordinating authority on international health work, and in particular, public health. So our objective is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. WHO uh, works through its uh, 7,000 or so staff in headquarters in Geneva, but also in six regions of the world, in the regional offices, as well as in 150 country offices that you can see on the screen here in terms of the little stars, and also working through the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And I mentioned this specialized agency of WHO uh, because it's of relevance to this presentation. So the core functions of WHO are listed here. I will not mention them all, but you can see that through the functions of evidence-based 
policy position development, norms and standards, and research agenda, we are very much in line with the mandate of the organization when it comes to our activities on radio frequency fields. Now, the work that we do with respect to radiation is held by the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health. So it's through this lens that we work on radiation. And we work on non-ionizing radiation as well as ionizing radiation. So non-ionizing radiation being the part of the spectrum dealing with electromagnetic fields from zero hertz to 300 gigahertz. And then the optical part of the spectrum, visible and ultraviolet radiation. And then we go into the ionizing part of the spectrum. So today I will discuss an activity that is really very much part of the international EMF project developed and established in 96 with two main ideas to investigate the health effects of EMF and also to advise national authorities on EMF radiation protection. And so this activity is actually quite long in its history. WHO has been reviewing findings of research on health effects from different agents, such as biological, chemical, and physical agents for several decades now. And in terms of electromagnetic fields, it has done that since the early 80s. Now, the electromagnetic field topic in terms of radio frequency fields started in 1981, and we had our latest uh, monograph on this topic in 1993. So you can understand that over that period from 93 to now, there has been a lot of new applications using radio frequency fields and in particular wireless technologies. So there's very much a need for an update on this health risk assessment. Uh, this document is expected to complete the trilogy of electromagnetic field health review, following two other monographs on static fields and on extremely low frequency fields. And so over the years, we have developed monographs both at WHO and in our specialized agency on cancer. So here I would like to explain the difference between the monographs of IARC and the monographs of WHO. So in terms of IARC, they do the hazard identification process when it comes to the topic of cancer. And you may have heard of their work in relation to the identification of the carcinogenicity of RF fields, which they published in 2013, classifying RF as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Now, the WHO headquarters, what they do is a whole health risk assessment, including this hazard identification, but also reviewing the uh, exposure assessment, exposure response, if any, and risk characterization, not just for cancer, but all the studied outcomes. And this is what I will be discussing with you today. Now, the objectives of this work is to review the scientific literature, looking at adverse health effects from exposure to RF, to perform this health risk assessment for all the studied health and points, and to compile a summary of national policies from around the globe. A previous one was done uh, in 2012, which will serve as a benchmark, and we are now updating this survey. And finally, the last objective is really to identify gaps in knowledge on this topic. So the scope of the work is as mentioned, radio frequency fields from 100 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz, looking at public exposures, so exposures of the general public, as well as uh, of workers. But we are not looking at medical exposures in the context of diagnosis or therapy. The target of audience for this document are mostly policymakers, 
of course, in ministries of health, but also it could be of interest for ministries of labor, of environment, of telecommunications, and also for bodies that are involved in developing uh, exposure guidelines for electromagnetic fields, such as a number of non-government organizations, such as ICNERP or IEEE. And uh, we expect that professional societies and academics may also be interested. So the process that we have followed is uh, to screen the health outcomes and develop preemptively some inclusion criteria and quality criteria before selecting the papers. And so these inclusion criteria are very much based upon whether the studies are epidemiological studies on population or laboratory studies on either human volunteers, animals, or cells. And we have also quality criteria developed and using the gold standards. A narrative review was developed up to 2015 and very thorough with over a thousand pages of, of uh, references. And we then uh, had in parallel in WHO a adoption of internationally recognized methods for guidelines development. And so we were requested to um, review the work that we had done in view of uh, these uh, new processes. And we therefore had to uh, contract a methodologist and start not from scratch, but kind of to contract number of systematic reviews. So these systematic reviews were very important in, in this process. And just for those of you who may not know what a systematic review is in this context, it's an investigation that is systematic and scientific that requires that we focus on a specific question and that we use scientific methods to identify, to select, to assess, and also to summarize the finding of different types of studies. The objective here uh, is really to use explicit methods and to be transparent in what we do. And so we first have to scope the topic, which is what we had done till 2015, to formulate specific questions, then synthesize the evidence, grade it, and then formulate recommendations. So to the topic of radio frequency fields, there are quite a number of health outcomes. We highlighted over 30 outcomes in our narrative review. And in view of the time and resources needed to complete uh, systematic reviews, we needed to restrict the number of questions to those dealing with areas of greatest controversy or uncertainty. And so we conducted a uh, broad international survey in 2018 to prioritize the potential uh, adverse health outcomes that would require a systematic review. And so we invited over 300 RF experts and we published the outcome of this survey. What was interesting to see is that the priority outcomes of greatest importance were cancer, fertility, symptoms, and cognitive performance. But we also saw that a couple of mechanisms of interactions were highlighted, such as heat and oxidative stress. So on this basis, we uh, chose the uh, systematic reviews to perform. What we did also is we asked for the rationale of these experts for choosing this, uh, whether it was based on the scientific evidence, on public concerns, or on burden of disease. And this is description of the 10 systematic reviews that uh, we have uh, been working on. So we have asked the systematic review teams to develop a protocol, to publish it, to register it in Prospero, which is a database for protocols, and to submit and publish the final reviews in the journal Environment International, which has kindly offered to do a special issue on this topic. And so as of now, nine out of the 10 systematic review protocols have been published and the teams are working diligently on finalizing the reviews.
So the technical outputs out of this work will be a technical report or a scoping report, a set of 10 systematic reviews, an EHC monograph that will elaborate on these health outcomes, an RF research agenda, and we expect several journal publications. So who worked on this? We had a core group of six members who have worked on the topic since uh, 2012, and they enlisted a number of contributors, about 20 or 30 contributors. Along with that, we have the systematic review teams, which is about 80 some people. And then we will enlist a task group made up of about 20 experts who will finalize the conclusions. We will allow some observers into this task group and of course, the work is overseen by the WHO Secretariat. For all of these experts, we request declarations of interest, which are reviewed very diligently. And here I show you the broad geographical distribution of the number of experts uh, across the world, and also in terms of gender, where we require a balance of gender and geography. Finally, the task group of experts, we had a call last fall. We had over 60 candidates applying, and we have shortlisted 20 of them for the final work. And this will be made uh, public in the very near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so let's uh, carry on the uh, session on uh, science perspective with uh, Martin Rosley who is going to talk about the result of a systematic review on health risk uh, from Wi-Fi. So Martin Rosley is Professor for Environmental Epidemiology at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel and lead, leads the Environmental Exposures and Health Unit. He is uh, a member in various national and international commissions on environmental health research, such as Aranis, Cosmos, and uh, the York. So I leave you the, the floor. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. As for the other speakers, it's a pity that I cannot attend the meeting in London, but, but there were many other activities. So also nice to take the advantages of wireless communication and communicate to London from here in Switzerland. So the paper that I would present has been published about a year ago. It's not a fully systematic review, but it's a review based on a systematic literature search and a systematic quality evaluation. But we did not um, fulfill all the criteria for fully systematic reviews, such as risk of bias analysis in a systematic manner. Um, as you can see, there are three co-workers to that work, uh, Stefan Dongus from my team, Hamid Chalilian, and David Schürmann, who is an expert in in vitro and in vivo research. And I've just recently seen that also the paper has been published only one year ago. It's all already among the most viewed paper ever um, of this journal. So there seems to be quite an interest in this topic. I think um, as, as a professor from Basel, where also Paracelsus has started 500 years ago, I think it's always important to look into exposure levels when we talk about health risk, as everything <clears throat> is expected to relate to in a, in a dose response manner. And these are some measurements conducted um, in the UK um, to measure the exposure from Wi-Fi devices and Wi-Fi access points as a uh, relation of distance. And you see that levels decay very rapidly with, with distance. Um, so with doubling of the distance, the levels fall about half of the values. Um, but what is very important also to realize here, this is not the typical um, exposure levels, but, but measurements were taken during the maximum data transmission. But the issue with Wi-Fi is that obviously there's a quite uh, limited data transmission. So, so the typical duty factors are much lower. So 
So then the average exposure is, is a factor of 10 to 100 or even less lower than what is shown here. So this is really the worst case condition during the peak. This then translates also into the typical exposure of people. So what we show here is a paper that has recently published from the UK SCAMP cohort studies where um, 148 adolescents carried a um, portable exposure measurement device during several days, um, typically two to three days. And the next slide shows then what we see in terms of exposure. We have grouped the exposure as a total of exposure, downlink exposure, uplink. So uplink, downlink is from the mobile phone base station, uplink is from the from the mobile phones itself, Wi-Fi broadcast and deck these cordless phones. And as you can see that the, the axis is um, logarithmic, so um, this has to be taken into account. The average, the median exposure in that sample was about 100 microwatt per meter squared, which is substantially below uh, the ICNIR limit of 10 watt per meter squared. And if you only look at the Wi-Fi um, measured exposure, then the median value in that sample was 7.7 .7 microwatt per meter squared, which is more than a million times less than the ICNIR limit for far field exposure. If you plot into the or look into the violin plots, you see that typically exposure is a bit higher um, at home and in schools than outdoors, as, as can be expected. This is in line with another paper uh, letter that just has been reviewed. Not sure whether you can see the levels, but basically what, what all these measurement studies shown um, is that typical levels for Wi-Fi is below 0.2 volt per meter, so quite low. You see uh, a few higher values in this table, but this is uh, basically studies that went really to the maximum exposure, so they disregarded the, the discontinuous con um, transmission or they went very close close to the source. So given that these low levels, you may wonder why did we really are concerned about Wi-Fi exposure and health risks. And the motivation is that some people have claimed that this, this continuous um, con transmission, this burst and short pulses from Wi-Fi, they have different health effects than other sources of electromagnetic fields. And in Switzerland, the governmental office for public health basically um, have been confronted with, with a lot of claims that Wi-Fi may be a problem for people. So citizens have called the, the, the government and said they have problems because of Wi-Fi. This was actually before 5G was introduced in 2017-18. Um, I think nowadays that the discussion has shifted a bit, but at that time Wi-Fi was the most often claimed source of problems and the complaints were typically sleep problems, headache or other non-specific symptoms. So there were a few reviews existing at that time. There was one from, from Foster and Mulder published in 2013. They have applied very stringent inclusion criteria and concluded that several studies observed biological effects due to Wi-Fi type of exposure, but technical limitations prevent drawing conclusions about possible health risks. And technical limitations is mostly, mostly related to exposure assessment in these studies and, and dosimetry. There was another review which was published in a German site and that made a lot of attention of people being concerned about Wi-Fi. This review was not peer-reviewed, it was also not systematic, so they basically focused on studies um, that found effects, have included more than 100 studies, but basically also very broad. It's not only Wi-Fi exposure, but all type of EMF exposure, but on, under the framework of Wi-Fi exposure discussed. And they had very strong conclusions that damage to the reproductive system impacts on the EEG and brain functions, as well as effects on the heart, liver, thyroid, gene expression, cell cycle, cell membranes, and bacterial and plants are related to, to Wi-Fi exposure. <laughs>
Another review also published about at the same time, which um, is supposed to be peer reviewed, um, was from Paul, also with very, very strong conclusions that um, a lot of different health effects are established uh, in terms of Wi-Fi exposure. But again, this is not this review was not very systematic, and there was quite some criticism to that review expressed in several letters. It's just three out of these letters, I think there were even more um, on, on that, that there are really problems with this paper. So the quality is really a problem. So, so the idea of our review was to be more systematic in literature screening, because that is what we have seen as a weaknesses in these uh, two reviews that were uh, so, so that we really had um, stringent criteria in terms of inclusion and also basic quality uh, evaluation criteria that we wanted to include. So for inclusion criteria, we, we focused on all types of study, but we only wanted to have studies using real Wi-Fi signals. And for quality, uh, we wanted to have at least one sham condition in any type of experimental studies, being it in vivo, in vitro or human studies. It had to be at least single blinded, preferably double blinded, and the exposure contrast had to be characterized. For epidemiology, the selection of study participants had to be clear and the basic confounders had to be included. You see, this is not very strict criteria. We were quite loose in the quality criteria, but, but the very basics we wanted to include in the review. So we have, based on our literature search, we have um, found more than 1,300 papers which would have been potentially interesting, but based on title and the abstract, we could exclude most of them. And after um, full text evaluation, another 200 papers were included. So this left us 23 papers which remained for evaluation, um, six epidemiological papers, six human experimental studies, nine papers on in vivo research and two papers on in vitro research. If you see that the reasons you find in the paper about the details, uh, the main issues they are highlighted is about that they have not studied biological effects. So there were a lot of exposure studies that we have found in the initial search, which could easily be identified from the title and abstract. And the other problem is that many studies did not um, use really a Wi-Fi signal, even if they have mentioned some kind of Wi-Fi in the paper, but they had continuous waves, which we did not consider eligible or not a Wi-Fi at all. So that is why we ended with very few papers. We also had to exclude because of quality criteria, mainly the blinding um, was missing in many studies on experimental studies. We ex had to exclude further quite some papers. So this leaves us with the following papers that have been included. As you see, there were most in vivo papers, but basically they are papers from three experiments in three different labs, so they are somehow connected. Just a lot of materials, a lot of outcomes they have looked in these experiments. And then we have the human experimental studies and the epidemiological studies. For the in vitro study, basically what we see is that they have applied relatively high exposure levels, uh, up to four watt per kilogram, so, so even in the occupational limits, but mostly they have not seen any associations with Wi-Fi exposure um, in terms of neurotoxicology or genotoxicology, reproduction or immunological parameters, which have been mostly studied. And here I just put one paper as an example. I cannot go through all the papers in this short time. But for instance, what I've seen here is a higher body weight in exposed males at week five. But all the other outcomes they have looked at were not related to Wi-Fi exposure. And that's a very typical um, pattern across the studies. Most uh, outcomes were not that associated. A few were sometimes, and these associations were not consistent in terms of the effect that have been found and may likely represent chance finding. The same is for epidemiology. Mostly no association has been found, sometimes positive associations like less headache when exposed. So again, really no consistency here. Um, what has to be said about the epidemiological studies is that the exposure assessment in the studies included was relatively weak. So typically um, these were studies in children and then the parents were asked whether they have an access point installed at home. 
So there's a lot of exposure misclassification and as the levels are very low, we basically concluded that not much can be concluded from these studies in terms of Wi-Fi exposure effects. In terms of human experimental studies, they were considered to be more informative. Uh, here's a typical example. Again, most studies in the human experiments did not find an association. What we can see here is, is a quite new, nice paper where they have used the relatively high exposure levels, higher than in their epidemiological studies, but still orders of magnitude below um, the guidelines. So this People have been during sleep uh, being exposed to this peak SAR of 6.4 milliwatt per kilogram, so about 100,000 times less than the, the regulatory limit. It was double blind, jam controlled, randomized, counterbalance, and 34 people took place. And then they have looked into the um, sleep macrostructure and sleep microstructure. They didn't find any effect on sleep macrostructure. And for sleep microstructure, 24 out of 25 EG parameters were not associated by but one was follow-up uh, there was after the review that was not included another paper from the same experiment where they didn't find big effects um, there was a bit of an improvement in a declarative cognitive task um, when people were exposed to eg but again both of these effects highlighted on these slides are probably um, just chance finding as there was no multiple comparison correction in this paper so to conclude Basically, there's no consistent association between any type of health effects and Wi-Fi exposure. So there's little evidence. There's also no evidence that this particular signal of the Wi-Fi may be more problematic than other types of EMF. So basically, we concluded that we can review all type of EMF um, in, a sim in a similar way. The number of good quality studies limited, and, and I think there's a certain need of experimental studies to, to better clarify whether the signal plays a role, whether a specific signal, whether the burst, whether the pulse rate and so on have different effects. So that's only an open question that could be clarified in future research. What we have seen, as I've seen in other reviews, low quality studies are more likely to report um, effects or associations and the, the reporting has certainly to be improved. Yeah, the, the, the outcome of that review has been used for a fact sheet of the government, which can be downloaded here. It's in German and France. And so then I would like to thank on the last slide, next slide to all my Contributors to that review, um, Stefan, Hamid and David, and um, you, you may happy to contact me in case of further questions. Thank you very much, Martin uh, Rosalyn. We are reassured about the Wi-Fi exposure. Uh, so it's time for, for the, uh, the discussion, the panel discussion, and the discussion uh, will be on uh, is there a consensus among uh, scientific reviews of EMF health risk. And the facilitator will be Dr. Kansha Muro Lupori. Dr. Kansha Muro Lupori is uh, the EMF and health expert in Telefonica. She uh, joined Telefonica in 2001. And uh, Kansha, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Yes? Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I leave you the floor. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this panel where we are going to try to meet an answer for this question. Do we have scientific consensus of health risks on RF electromagnetic field? Let me tell you all the participants of this panel are in remote. Professor Martin Rosley, of whom we had the opportunity to listen to his wonderful speech uh, this morning. Dr. Emily van den Benter from WHO. She's in remote from Ghana, I think. I'm not sure if she's able to attend to the discussion. Let's see. And we had two more panelists. Let me introduce you both of them. First, Professor Sarah Logran. She's a member of one of the expert committees of the WHO. She's part of the scientific body of the NIR. She's currently the director of radiation research and advice and the principal researcher and EME program manager at ARPANSA. For this reason, we asked Sarah to participate in this panel and make a short introduction about the risk assessment work of ARPANSA. Please, Sarah, you have the floor. 
So just a few words about um, our Panza and our approach to uh, risk in this area. So uh, APANSA is the Australian Government's primary health authority on radiation protection and nuclear safety. And although we look at all types of radiation in relation to RF, um, EMF, we have a dedicated electromagnetic energy program which aims to promote health and safety as well as address misinformation about EME emissions. So there's a number of ways in which we do this, a number of initiatives that we are undertaking in our EME program um, to provide evidence-based scientific advice on EME and health, but also ensure that there's a safe radiation environment for the Australian community. Uh, so just to highlight the main things that we are doing in the EME program, one major part of our program is to assess RF exposure in the community. And we do this in a number of different ways. For example, assessing typical EME exposures in our everyday environments, assessing exposures from different sources, as well as assessing EME exposure changes over time, particularly as new technologies are developed and deployed, such as 5G. We also have a, a very heavy research program uh, on EME and health. So we promote and coordinate, but also fund and lead global research uh, in this area. And we've also published an EME research agenda that aims at identifying current research gaps and recommendations for specific areas of research uh, where the body of knowledge uh, needs to be expanded. We have a big international engagement component in our program to build new knowledge and contribute to research as well as international safety standards and guidelines. And this helps to also ensure that they are fit for purpose in uh, the Australian context. And one of the major things that we also do is developing new safety standards. So we heard earlier um, about the new ICNIRP guidelines and Australia was one of the first countries to adopt those guidelines in our new RF safety standard, which was released uh, last year. And I think the fifth element uh, that I'll mention today of what we do, which is really, really important, is communication. So that's communication uh, with scientific bodies, governments, but also really importantly, the public. So risk communication is a big part of what we're doing and something that we're increasingly aware of in our program. And it's made meant we've made a lot of changes in this regard as well in, in how we communicate uh, the work we're doing and the work that's happening around the world in this space. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. That means a huge work, an excellent guideline to share with the rest of the world. Now let me introduce you, Professor Teodoro Samaras from Aristoteles University. He also works as a professor in Malta University. He has an incredible scientific background and research in this topic, ENF and health. He's here today, today also because he's currently a member of the European Commission Scientific Committee on Health, Environmental and Emerging Risk, Share. So please, Teodoro, uh, do you mind giving us the next step for the shared preliminary opinion? Thank you very much for the introduction, Concha, and uh, thank you for this invitation. I am in my office in Greece, uh, not connected with Wi-Fi, but anyway. Uh, now, it's not only the last, uh, the latest um, opinion from uh, the European Commission, from the European Commission Scientific Committee that uh, uh, concerns uh, electromagnetic fields. You know that the European Union, with its uh, scientific commissions, has already issued uh, five uh, different opinions, uh, with the earliest one starting in 1998 with the Scientific Steering Committee uh, that led to the Council recommendation for adopting the ICNIRP 1998 uh, uh, guidelines. Now, the latest mandate we have as a scientific uh, committee on uh, emerging and environmental health uh, risks uh, was given to us back in 2021, immediately after the publication of the uh, latest ICNIRP guidelines of 2020. And the question was whether in the radiofrequency range there should be a change in the technical annexes of that council recommendation, the one from 1999, uh, to accommodate the new uh, guidelines of of, uh, ICNIRP 2020. Uh, the preliminary opinion came out, as you know, uh, in the summer. Uh, 
uh, that, that opinion we call EMF1 because there is another one uh, opinion that is being prepared now uh, on EMF2, which this EMF2 is the low frequencies. But the preliminary opinion was uh, put into consultation for uh, about uh, one month. And we have received uh, to this opinion for radio frequencies, we received about 250 uh, different comments. Some of them, they are uh, comments at many uh, points of the opinion, which means that we have more than 1,000 points to look at. And uh, currently we're working on that. Uh, as you know, the procedures of operation of the Scientific Committee on, uh, on Environmental and Emerging Environmental and Health Risk this year, which is the Scientific Committee where I, I participate, uh, has to answer to every single comment that comes uh, uh, as during the consultation. And this gives us a lot of uh, work. In this opinion, then, in the preliminary opinion, as you have noticed, most of you, uh, we already state that the scientific committee uh, believes that the council recommendations should be updated and should be updated with the new ECNIRP uh, guidelines of uh, 2020. And this is what we recommend. So the timeline is a little bit uh, obscure at the moment. It's a little bit doubtful at the moment because of these uh, many uh, comments that uh, we have. Most of them, of course, are against our decision. And uh, you know how uh, people comment this in these uh, situations. But uh, it will take us some time before we arrive to the final opinion, which I don't think will change very much with respect to the draft uh, opinion. I don't know when the, what the timeline will be, but uh, it will be uh, as soon as possible for my side, because uh, for the first time, I have to say, we have been asked not to do only risk assessment, but also to do some kind of risk management. And uh, I think it's very important for the DGs that mandated us with this uh, task to have a, a clear answer very soon to, to apply their policies. Thanks so much, Professor Samaras. Great work. Congratulations for this huge as for, for the whole SHARE committee. We are looking forward to the final paper, hopefully as soon as possible, as you said. Let's start the discussion. Now I'm going to give the floor to Jack Rowley, who is in London with people are attending in person for this event. Jack, you have the floor, please. Excuse me. So anyone that's in the room, if you've got a question about the first couple of presentations that you'd like to ask, I've got a microphone that we can bring to you. For those online, we've got some questions that have also been submitted to Concha. If, the, if you're still thinking, we have some pre-prepared questions, as everyone does at these sort of events, to get the discussions going. So we've got a question here in the room. So perhaps if you introduce yourself, it will help for the panelists. And maybe we can get all the panelists to come up on the screen so that uh, we can see them in the room. My name is Sarah Wiley, here for the GSMA EMF and Health Group and also for Vodafone. And my question is for Dr. Van de Venter. You mentioned the IARC classification. I would be interested to know if there are any plans for an update to that classification in the light of recent publications. Thank you. So, yeah, as uh, you know, a couple of years ago, IARC prioritized its next agents for review in terms of carcinogenicity. And the topic of radio frequency fields was included in that list. This was not first priority. They have done a number of other agents since uh, since that list was developed, but they are still expecting to uh, look at this. And of course, this will depend on the timing of the uh, RF monograph development and finalization. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Emily, while you're up, maybe I can ask one of the questions we had on the chat. You said you mentioned timing, so maybe you could indicate if you can what your expectations are of the timing for the technical report, the task group, when the systematic reviews themselves, we can start to expect to see them appearing. Yes. So in terms of the technical report, we are finalizing it now. It's a very large document with, as I mentioned in my presentation, quite a number of health outcomes. Uh, this should be finalized early next year. For the systematic reviews, we expect a submission by the end of this year. This is what was agreed with the different teams. And with respect to the monograph itself, as mentioned, the task group is being finalized right now. And we hope that by October next year, we can have a final document. Thanks very much, Emily. Are there any other questions here in the room? Yes, we've got another one here. 
Thank you. Uh, Molly Romney, uh, formerly with uh, CGBP and Keysight. Uh, I'm interested in the, the outcome of the systematic review is, is definitely showing very little evidence for, for uh, negative health effects. One of the things that confounds me about the whole subject is that there do appear to be some therapeutic effects of pulsed radiation, which are, are widely used in the healing of, of bone fractures. And those are Wi-Fi-like signals, and they're roughly a, a thousand times lower than the ICNAP limit. So I'm fascinated about the fact that there are, appear to be well-established therapeutic effects at levels well below ICNRP. Then the question would be, well, why would there be any? Why wouldn't there be any any, any pathogenic effects? Uh, Martin Paul has theorised about the reasons for the therapeutic effects based on calcium mobility, and also theorised about the, the negative effects with oxidative stress. So I'm interested to know how much work is going on in, in that area, trying to explain how can this both be a, a therapeutic but not a pathogenic effect. Uh, any thoughts on that, um, potentially, um, and Martin Rosley, from the, some of the reviews you looked at? Thanks for the questions. In, in the review, we didn't look at uh, therapeutic effects, and um, I'm aware that, that these type of studies are done for, for quite a while. But I don't think that the signal that is usually used, this pulsed um, thing, is really related, like that you can consider it Wi-Fi like. I mean, it's it's also called pulsed, but but it's typically a, a low frequency, which is then turned on and turn, turned off. I think uh, Theo maybe can explain a bit better than myself about that. I also think what, what is a problem, we, we have once looked into a systematic review on therapeutic effects of, of madrasses, and what we realized is that Many of these studies have not been double-blinded and that they miss a lot of um, quality criteria. I, I'm not 100% sure whether this is also true for these bone effects that you just have mentioned. I have to admit I have to look closer into that. But I don't think you can really connect it directly to a Wi-Fi exposure. Professor Summers, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, if I may add this... Um applications of pulsed magnetic fields, they are low frequency, as Martin mentioned. They are mainly because of the currents that uh, take place, the induced currents that take place in the tissue, and uh, they, they are not considered of the same interaction mechanism like the Wi-Fi signal, which is mainly electromagnetic wave traveling and interacting with the tissue. So also the nature of interaction is different with the biological tissue. So I don't think we can infer main, much, many conclusions from uh, those mechanisms and, and transfer them to the interaction of uh, Wi-Fi or, uh, or mobile uh, telephones uh, with the, the tissues. Thanks, Theo. Can I also invite Sarah to comment? Because I know our panza scientists looked at the proposed mechanism that Mark and Paul has claimed around effects on, for example, cal calcium channels and ion channels. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I think I would really just be echoing what Martin and, and Theo have already, already said as well. So I don't think there's, unlike the other elements that we've been talking about with relation to RF, where we have really good indication of, you know, whether there are health effects or not and, and um, thresholds, this work hasn't really been substantiated either. So knowing exactly what the mechanism for these therapeutic effects might be or if they are indeed real um, comes down to some of the quality aspects of the work as well. So I think until we, we get some more replication in this area, um, it's really difficult to make any conclusions about that. Just to finish that off, I'd suggest uh, reading the review by Wooden Carapides of the mechanism of calcium channel effects. And essentially they conclude that there is no biophysical basis for any possible effect above about 10 megahertz. So the mechanism that he proposes doesn't really apply at the higher frequencies. But I think read that paper, I think that's a really good explanation of where the science is at on that. Concha. Yes, there are a few minutes left. Please, I ask you, if you want to make a question, you can use the chat of this meeting. In the meantime, I would like to come back to the end of this panel. If we were to make some broad assertions, it would be that our panza emphasized uh, what is known, Swiss reviews emphasize uncertainty, that Health Council also emphasized uncertainty, a shared somewhere in between, 
we have 5G report uh, from Commission on Radiological Protection of Germany, cigars from Spain, answers from France highlight the uh, need more research, and we don't know how uh, WH uh, how, uh, will approach this circling and circling balance. Do you agree? May I ask you a sentence uh, with your opinion for this final discussion, please, for all of you? Maybe I will start, because I think you mentioned our Panzer first. So uh, from the Arpanza perspective, so our core value is to protect people um, and also give Australians clear information on the potential risks, I guess, associated with um, exposure to all types of radiation. And you mentioned about the uncertainty element, and that is an important aspect, but I guess we tend to look at the whole picture to provide our clear assessment to support public safety. So I think based on that, I'd agree with what you said, that we do emphasise what is known, especially in our outward communication and our public outreach. But that's not to say that we don't take uncertainty into account because we certainly do. And I guess I think one particularly good example of that is the Arpanza RF safety standard that was published last year, the RPSS1, which sets exposure limits conservatively and well below levels at which established health effects occur to provide additional protection, but also to account for uncertainty. So, so yes, uh, we definitely emphasise what is known, but that's yeah, not to say that we don't take uncertainty into account as well. Maybe Dr. Martin Rosley, you can give the next. Yeah, I think it's a very, very tricky question because in public uh, communication, you, you can say the same things in two different manners. Um, I mean, you can say that there's no health effect has been established, but there's also sometimes a statement that that basically absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. And obviously, these two statements depend a bit on how much research has already been done on, on a certain subject. And, and for some subjects like brain tumour and mobile phone use, there's a lot of research and I think uncertainty has, is still there, but has reduced a lot. But, but for any emerging area, there's always the, the case that there's also very little research and then there's the question how much you want to emphasise the uncertainty, which then, of course, it's important to some extent to say where is the uncertainty and where, where research is needed. But to some extent, there's also some effect of, of this that people get worried and, and that this also affects quality of life and, and so on. So it's quite tricky to keep the balance and I certainly don't know what, what is the best balance here. But I agree that, that the Swiss report is, is a bit more on the, on the side where also uncertainty and future research um, is, is emphasised uh, to some extent. Thank you, Martin. Emily, please. From a WHO perspective, uh, as you know, and as I mentioned, we are working on reviewing the available science that we can find in published work. This has been a huge amount of effort to do this, and both from a systematic point of view and for transparency. So uh, what we put a lot of effort on is to uh, describe exactly which papers we have included and which papers we have excluded based on what type of criteria in terms of quality of inclusion. And uh, yes, of course, uncertainty is inherent in uh, these type of topics. When it comes to new technologies, of course, we have very little to go by. For example, if we talk about 5G, and millimeter waves. There's not much research that has been, of course, done in this topic from a health perspective, but we can infer certain information based on the mechanisms that we already know. So I completely agree with Martin that this communication aspect is very much key, and it's also really a challenge from the perspective of the health institutions, but of course, uh, all the stakeholders involved. Thank you. Theo, please. Yes, as you know, with uh, in CIR, we work with our uh, memorandum on the weight of evidence approach. So what we use is we try to collect evidence, then we score it for, for quality. And of course, uncertainty at all levels, as Emily mentioned before, is a very important and inherent factor.
because you might have uncertainty in the exposure assessment. You might have even uncertainty in the uh, transfer of your results from your animal model to, to human health. So uncertainty is taken into account in all these different uh, steps. And eventually we have ev for every uh, endpoint we have to result with we have to come up with some level of evidence which uh, falls um, on different uh, on different categories putting different weights of course on the lines of evidence or our sources of information that have less uncertainty we put more weight there than information that has more uncertainty where we put uh, less weight so Indeed, uncertainty we take very much into account in, in uh, the sheer evaluations of uh, risk assessment, but there is something we have to converge in different expert groups because Emily has also mentioned about quality criteria and uncertainty, and I don't think that there are standardized guidelines on what we, I mean, we have these prisma techniques, etc., but we don't know what is a good dosimetry and what is bad dosimetry uh, for different types of experiments, for example, or what uncertainty is acceptable and what is not. So I don't think we have converged there the different expert panels yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks all of them. Jack, we have room just for one comment or question, so go ahead. I think you have a question. Yeah, we have one more question in the room, please. Yeah, my, my name is Dirk Schulz. I'm with Vodafone, and I have exactly a question in this direction uh, about this, these quality issues, and it goes to Martin Rösli as well, and maybe to the whole panel. Your conclusion was that quality matters. Uh, we heard or I hear very often some of these quality problems are easy to avoid, actually. But I ask myself what we can do to avoid it. That means what can GSMA can do to avoid it. On the end of the day, we spend a lot of effort and a lot of time. And we have a result where we are not sure, can we trust it, can we not? Is it true, is it not true? So is there something what we could do to avoid this situation? A lot has to do with education, and I think the issue is that there's about, I don't know, maybe worldwide 20 or 30 research groups on EMF which have a long track record on EMF which apply rigor methods and apply quality. But the problem is that at least in the last time, maybe it has changed now with the new European program a bit, but there's not much funding there. So, so from this relatively few research group, if I compare with other groups, there does not came so much research out of it. On the other hand, the, the, the scientific literature is then floated with, with a lot of, I would call self-made research, where people just didn't have the resource and the funding to do proper research. And I think this makes then the, the difficult um, situation that when you look into the all scientific papers, even peer-reviewed, you find a lot of papers that just use the mobile phone for an exposure system. We don't have any ideas how much it transmitted, whether it transmitted at all, and, and so on, uh, whether, and how much heat it generated, and whether observed effects are due to heat or EMF. So I think the only thing that we can do is really to have a proper protocol, proper founding of research. And I mean, the, we can probably little do about the... Uh, the floating of, of low quality research in peer reviewed literature, which is a trend uh, I see over the last 20 years, which has increased quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Martin. Jack, I think just uh, we have one minute left. If you have a very quick question, let's go. Or... Maybe I'll ask one last question and, and ask you for a very quick answer. So, the question for the session was Is there a consensus among expert groups? If we go around the table, and we've got one word answer, yes, no, or maybe. Maybe we can get each of your views on that question. So we start with Sarah. Sure. Yes, leaning towards maybe. Uh, Martin? Yes, I think if you refer to expert groups in, in, in terms of national committees, I, I see that consensus. But I see a lot of other stakeholders here with little research um, um, behaving like research that may have completely different uh, opinion. Thanks, Martin. Theo? Well, you have to define the expert panel first <laughs> before you go <laughs> for consensus between the expert panels. Or you have to define, even one step back, what, what an expert is eh? or who is the expert. But I would say that if we, as Martin said, if we have expert panels of different countries or international expert panels, I think there is a consensus there, yes. 
to a great uh, to a great extent. Not 99%, as you mentioned, for, or you have for some chemicals, but uh, the percentage is quite high for these uh, expert panels. Yes. Thank you, Theo. And Emily, the, the last. Yeah, I would agree with the, the comments that were made already. Of course, it depends on the reviews and uh, who is uh, performing the reviews. Uh, but uh, so far, we see that at, the, at least at the national level, when there is a pool of experts that actually knows the topic, we see a consensus. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Concha, do you want to wrap up the panel? Yes, I would like. Excellent discussion, as well, which is a pleasure to have you in this forum. Thanks indeed to all of you for your participation. Thanks a lot. I give you back the floor again, Jack. Yes. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Jack, that thanks to the panelists and to, to Concha for facilitating that panel. Uh, we've got about a 15 minute break at this point in the program. For those who are on, in the room, there is tea and coffee here. For those who are online, you can have a time zone appropriate break at this point and, and we'll try and reconvene on time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for those who are in the room, if you can please take your seat. And to those online, apologies for the slight delay in resuming. The, the coffee and the pastries were better than anticipated. We were having trouble getting people to sit back down to continue. Uh, for the second session, this is going to be more focused on compliance and policy. Uh, just a couple of, again, uh, reminders. Those QR codes that are on your desks, my colleagues tell me that the millimeter wave safety report is available. If you click on that QR code, you can access that. We've also done uh, some updates to the 5G EMF surveys map that you find on the GSMA website as well with some latest data, I think from Australia and Malta has been added to, to the maps. Uh, so we're gonna reconvene with the second session, the first topic of which is gonna be about assessing EMF compliance 5G network equipment. Can I confirm that uh, our colleague Jose from KPN is online to introduce this session? Thank you, Jack. Welcome everyone to the to our next session. I would like to welcome all the participants for our, for joining us today. Uh, but also, I would like to thank you everyone who's been involved, especially within DSMA, in organizing this uh, this event. And I hope that I could meet everyone in person next time, and especially now that I've heard about the excellent pastry. So I'll be definitely, I will be joining next year. So this session is about the uh, assessing EMF compliance of 5G equipment, and we have two speakers, which I will introduce. So first we have Mike Wood. He is a technology leader at EME standards, governance and risk management, and also GSMA, EMF and health vice chair, um, and he works for, for Telstra. And we have Dr. Nicola Pasquino, professor at the University of Naples and chair of the technical committee CCT 106. Mike, the floor is yours. Good evening, good morning uh, to the GSMA team and everybody uh, online. Yes, uh, the uh, the coffee and the scones or the pastries did look good, but we only saw the coffee beans here. But uh, I note this had a uh, fireside chat. Well, in fact, uh, it might look like I'm up close to a 5G antenna, but this is indeed a photograph I took when measuring compliance for 5G networks. This was at the Gold Coast in Australia. And I'm just a, a fun fact for you. I was about uh, between six and seven meters from the antenna, and we were measuring just under the public exposure limit with the uh, 5G network running at full traffic. But uh, my role today as chair of the IEC TC106 is to give you an update on the assessing EMF compliance of 5G network equipment. What I'm very proud to announce today, you've heard about, so we heard about the uh, exposure limits and the work in the scientific domain to assess the possible health effects from RF. We're working on the compliance assessment side at the IEC, and we also feed a lot of our work into the ITU as well. I'm very pleased to be able to announce that the latest IEC 62232, uh, edition three, has just been approved. And in fact, uh, we announced this at the plenary meeting we held last month uh, in Naples, uh, in Italy. And an addition three includes a number of significant changes. And it's mainly to cater for the 5G assessments that we've uh, been talking about or we're about to talk about today. But the key changes to addition three of this uh, new standard, it has an increased frequency range of 100 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. 
And that's to ensure that it captures all of the different 5G frequencies that come into the future. And we mentioned millimetre wave earlier, but also importantly at the low end to make sure at shared sites that there are assessment methods for co-located sites with other radio frequency equipment and transmitters. Very importantly, it includes assessment methods for 5G beamforming. So we know there's a many advantages to 5G, and in fact, one of the significant advantages is the ability to be able to send a signal directly to where the users are and not to send signals in areas where there is less traffic. That reduces the overall power, it reduces the interference, and overall, the time averaged exposure levels are lower when you take into account beamforming. So to do a true assessment of 5G exposure, you do need to take into account variations like beamforming. Also, and this is probably the most uh, important aspect of the uh, standard, we now introduce in this standard the what, methods to assess the actual or realistic powers for 5G base stations. Now, I mentioned in the picture you can see behind me, or this, this 5G antenna here, if this was operating continuously at full traffic in one direction, then what we measured here behind me was the public exposure limit at around six to seven metres from the antenna. But under normal use, when people are using the network and there are many people spread out, the actual, the actual exposure level is way less than that because it's not transmitting all of the time and it's only sending a signal when it's needed to, to the people connecting. Now, to support this, what the new standard also includes is case studies from live 5G networks. And we're gonna hear about one of those shortly, but it's very important that we have in the standard, one of the appendices, Appendix C, has some case studies from live networks that demonstrate how to monitor the actual EMF levels. And in situations where you can monitor it, um, how to put controls in place or the methods you would need if you were doing exposures to actual levels. One of the things often asked is, well, what if the level increased? What if suddenly everybody wanted to connect on their device at the one point in time? It's very unlikely, but if it did and you're doing actual assessments, what the standard requires is that you have monitoring and that you have controls in place on the network so that the network won't exceed the time averaged exposure limit. So we've got monitoring and controls, and we're going to hear a case study very shortly about that. And of course, finally, the methods in the IEC are valid for assessing compliance to ICNRF 2020. That is one of the most important aspects of the update. So really, we've got an increased frequency range. It caters for all of the variations for 5G assessments. There are include, we include case studies. We often get asked, can 5G be measured? It certainly can. The case studies will show that. And the methods are valid for assessing to ICNRF 2020. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Nicola from the University of Naples. And uh, Professor, I'll hand over to you to give us an example that is featured in the new document. And in the uh, chat, I'm going to post a link to the new standard or the blog referring to the new standard. So great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jack and Jose. And uh, good to see you again, Mike. Like Mike said, I'm going to show you some uh, the results of some uh, experimental research uh, about the uh, assessing uh, of EMF compliance of uh, 5G network equipment. What we will focus on today, and by the way, I guess I will take uh, much less than uh, the 10, 15 minutes that have been uh, reserved. So we will uh, make up with, uh, with the delay. I will show you the results of some measurements on live commercial uh, 5G networks, uh, just to show you that 5G is here, or at least is in Italy, because that's where we, we made our, our measurements. And it can be measured. You know, many people say, how do we measure 5G uh, signal? That's, we, we can measure it and I will show you how. Uh, I will show you some, um, the results of uh, a case study about power monitoring and control systems, which have been introduced by uh, the latest version of uh, 62232, under three different scenarios, just to show you what happens when we have the system uh, uh, operating and when it's not. If you want to read more, you can see at the end the reference 
to a paper that was published back in uh, 2020, and then that has been also included in the references of the latest edition three of uh, EIC 62232. The measurement site, uh, first of all, this is a line of sight in Rome, in Italy, a measurement site. You can see it's a pretty much, uh, it's a measurement site very close to the 5G base station. The measurement point was on a line of sight, uh, some maybe 80 meters away from the source. Uh, we started from the initial compliance. This is one, the first scenario that I will show. Initial compliance means uh, that the power that was required from the, uh, the 5G base station was uh, such that it was just at the strict, very strict limit, uh, uh, exposure limit that we have in Italy. Then we increased the power and we switched the power monitoring and control on just to see what happens uh, with and without this new feature. We monitor both power and resource blocks at the base station, at the source, and at the measurement point, we used uh, a cell phone, uh, which was configured with UDP transmission to activate the beam and to drain as much resources as possible, as much power as possible from the source. And the exposure was monitored through uh, during transmission by measuring the channel power. Now, these are the three scenarios that uh, we have um, measured in the three different situations. On the left, you see the nominal power with the, the power monitoring and control off. As you can see, we monitor the power transmitted at the base station, the uh, channel power at the measurement site, and the resource blocks transmitted at the antenna. From the power uh, at the antenna and the resource blocks, you can see that there's a continuous transmission at the highest level, which was configured about 46 dBm. The channel power was the highest possible because uh, with that configuration, because the resource blocks that we required through the UDP transmission was basically the full spectrum available to the, uh, to the user. Then after a few minutes just to check how things go and uh, things go pretty well, I mean, uh, the transmission is stable, resource blocks have normal fluctuations, the channel power remains at a level that corresponds to the respect of the, uh, the compliance with the exposure limits, we moved to an increased power scenario, but still with the power monitoring and control off. Why did we increase the power at the antenna? As you can see, there's a 5 dB increase. Oh, let me show PO and channel power. Let go to uh, P0 has been increased by 5 dB. Maybe we want to do that because we want to increase the coverage area. So we want the uh, control signals to go farther from the source. But uh, in this scenario, we didn't uh, use the power monitoring and control. We didn't limit the exposure. And as you can see here, in fact, the channel power has increased by 5 dB. There's no limitation in the power, which means that there's no limitation in the exposure. If the power is increased by 5 dB, then the exposure increases by almost 5 dB. Resources are still uh, reserved to the uh, UDP transmission protocol, so the only user was the one that got all the resources available. Then we increased scenario on the right, increased the power, but then we turned the power monitoring and control on. And as you can see, since the power monitoring and control limits the average power over a certain time, six minutes in this case. At the beginning, you continue transmission. The station was continuing to transmit at the same top level. But after a while, it realized, it sensed that the limit was going to be approached. And so it applied the limitation, the 5B limitation, the 5DB limitation, so that the transmitted power got back to the value that guaranteed the compliance with the exposure limits. In fact, the channel power decreases by the same amount going back to the pre-increase, let's say, value. Again, resources were fully reserved to the only user thanks to the UDP transmission, the full frame uh, transmission. If we look at it from another point of view, we can focus on uh, the a zero span approach. We look at the frequencies around the synchronization blocks 
the same three scenarios, the nominal power, the increased power with PMC off and the increased power with PMC on. But we now only look at a portion of the spectrum where the control channel is located together with the traffic channel. If you look at the initial situation, the initial scenario, nominal power without any uh, power monitoring and control, we can see that both control and traffic are at the same level. You see zero dB, it's a reference level for us. Then if we increase the power without activating the power monitoring and control, both control and traffic channels, they rise by five dB, as you can see here. At the end, if you activate with the increased power, if you activate the power monitoring and control, you see that the traffic channel go back to the zero level, to the reference level, which guarantees for compliance with the exposure limits. But the control, the traffic, the control channels stay up because you wanted uh, to increase the, you increase the power because you wanted to have a larger coverage. So uh, this is the proof that when the power monitoring and control is on, even with increased power, the coverage will not be affected while the traffic will be limited. And that's basically what uh, the conclusions are. The power monitoring and control system does the job. It does limit exposure without limiting the coverage. It does limit exposure, and by that, you can ensure compliance to exposure limit. One of the most interesting features is that once you activate it, it takes care. Of course, not everything is disclosed by the vendors. So the specific way for each uh, power monitoring and control uh, system to operate is undisclosed usually by the vendors, by the manufacturer. But you know that over six or 30 minutes, depending on the configuration, then there will be a limitation uh, of the exposure, I would say automatically. Once you activate it and once it has been configured appropriately, then it takes care of limiting exposure without any further action. In Italy, of course, we're waiting eagerly to, uh, for the new edition to be published because we will uh, harmonize our uh, national standard uh, with the uh, new edition. And um, most specifically, we will include, we will uh, probably revise the Annex E of our guide to electromagnetic field measurements, which is the CEI uh, 211-7, the Annex E, which is about two, three, and four, and 5G measurement uh, generated by base, uh, by base stations. I would say that this concludes my presentation. Uh, of course, I would be glad to answer some questions if you have any, and uh, thanks again for uh, being here. That was excellent. We, we have got a couple of questions and there's a couple of points you raised there, particularly that last point about the, uh, you know, the adoption of 62232 into the national standards. And I think you said when it's ready, it will be published in the November timeframe. So what has been agreed is the final draft international standard. Some countries buy that uh, directly from the IEC. And if they do that, they then get a copy of the fully published standard when it's available but it's approved now. In fact, we had 100% consensus when it went out to vote by all of the different national committees. And that was a, uh, we talked about consensus before in the previous session. There's, there's a lot of work that's gone into this. And I think you've just demonstrated some of the research and the testing that goes to underpin this particular standard. Of course, this is one of a number of case studies, but it probably focuses on one of the key points Regulators and government authorities want to make sure that compliance standards can be met. Operators want to make sure that the assessment is correct, and obviously assessors want to do the same thing. So this provides the method of doing both. So look, I'd really like to thank you, uh, Nicola, for your work in this, and also a shout out to the whole team at the IEC, led by Des Ward and Christophe Barange. We have got time for some questions, and I think I just answered a couple, which was when when will it be available? It will be available in November, and can it be applied now? The answer to that is yes, and we would encourage government regulators uh, to adopt uh, the 62232 standard. Jose or, or Jack in the room, I'm not sure what other questions we have. We were going to make a couple of comments on the new case studies, but Maybe we'll go to the questions first. Uh, Mike, we do have a question here in the room, so I'll just get the microphone to the person. 
Uh, Murray Romney here. Yeah, just fascinating analysis there. I, I'm interested, how do you see this PMC working in a multi-vendor and a, a, a multi-site location? I can see how it works very well when, you're, when you've got a single carrier or one, one, one operator. Uh, how, how do you see this working in three dimensions with multiple operators, potentially from different locations where the, where the point of interest might be somewhere in between? Well, actually, thank you for, for, the, for the question. We didn't test with multiple sources from different vendors. We had the opportunity to work with uh, one operator in Italy, which was Vodafone. And so we, we could uh, uh, monitor their transmitted power. I think that, well, of course, that, that there's something we can do as far as we are. We have access to the monitor, the power transmitted and the resource blocks because the channel power can, is measured on the uh, user side. So that's something that we can do no matter how many sources are active at a specific moment because there will be uh, the total available uh, uh, power at the receiving point. We haven't tested uh, with multiple sources indeed. Maybe there's something that we can do in the, in the future. I assume that if you get some kind of, since in Italy, well, I must say that in Italy, you have a configuration that um, requires that before you set up a base station, you have kind of preliminary investigation uh, about the maximum power that you can transmit uh, so that the entire set, the environment will be safe in terms of compliance mm. with the limits. I'm not sure how things may change in terms of experimental uh, setup, because as far as you are, you set, you configure a specific base station so that uh, the specific power, nominal power, must not be overseeded, overcome, then it will uh, uh, activate as soon as it's required to transmit more power than it is allowed. That P0, the nominal power, has been configured by considering uh, uh, the power that that specific base station could transmit so that together with the remaining base stations, base stations in the area, the whole environment was compliant with the exposure limits. So I think that, but again, we didn't test it. I think that once you configure each base station with the nominal power, the system may work pretty well. Maybe they will not start at the same time, but in the end, they will do their job almost harmonically, I would say. This will be one of the case studies or one of the assessments that go into the new 62669 series uh, because over the next two years we're looking to go to all continents to do case studies just like the one you mentioned but what the current standard requires is that you need to take into account both network systems so if there's some uncertainty to build in there because of the power variation that would need to be added we've looked at the 4g and 5g power monitoring systems so potentially two separate networks uh, and they can work together, but there's a little bit more involved in doing that. So again, it would be conservative until you link both the monitoring <laughs> systems together. But a very excellent question and one that will be answered in the next round of case studies. But Jose, I, I'm not sure on the time. I know that the coffee and scones took up a bit more time, but do we have, we, we may have a couple of extra questions, but I can't see them, Jose. Are there are they more we've, coming in? We've, we've actually received several questions um, via the chat. I'm not going to be very strict on time or one minute past one, but I, I think that we still have some. If Jack agrees, then we can still do one question. I will, I will start by with the latest one. Does the decrease in exposure make a difference for EMF and not coverage? Question mark. Should there be a coverage signal within a certain safety distance according to the legislation? This is a question from Cesar Erti. The decrease in, uh, in the exposure, well, there's no de decrease. Technically, from my presentation, there was no decrease in the exposure. Uh, there was a going back to the exposure that was, if, if that's the, the question, to the exposure that was uh, compliant with limits. So there was no actual decrease. There was a going back. I'm not sure whether I understood the question, but there's no decrease 
there's a going back to the nominal value of the exposure. Maybe Jose, just to clarify, in in the six two two three two standard with case studies, what did decrease was the exposure over time. So the time the time averaged exposure was set so that it would not increase, it would not go above the limits. The instantaneous uh, peak would, of course, because that's how you get the coverage. If the if the exposure limits were instantaneous peak, then it's a different story. The exposure limits are time averaged over six or 30 minutes. So the average level did was maintained, and that's how the system worked. And there was a certain point about in the question, I'm just looking at it, should there be a certain signal within a safety distance? Well, the, the regulations set the exposure limits. We have to make sure that there is still coverage to service emergency services. So that's maintained. So emergency services and connection are maintained while the exposure limits are also maintained. But again, this is why it's very important when you have a look through this standard to look at the monitoring requirements if you're going to apply this averaging factor. And, and the whole point about the time we took to do this standard was to bring the best scientific methods to do this analysis. So that's what the standard offers. And I think the case study you showed there, Nicola, was a, a great example. Uh, was there one more question, um, Jose? Yes, there's another question from Armando Marquez, which will obviously be our last question. And his question is, for 5G antennas, how you perform the extrapolation calculation, particularly for calculate the fixed factor? And I think massive MIMO antennas for 5G. Massive MIMO antennas, that's the question. Did you want to do that, Nicola, or did you want me to have a go to start with? Well, if it's more related to the 62232, maybe uh, let's you answer the question. Well, if I understand what it's asking for the MIMO antennas, I mean, there are th in 62232, there are three main factors you look at. It depends on how MIMO is set up, but you may have a, you may have a set of beams or a grid of beams, and you've got a broadcast, a wide area broadcast signal, that doesn't carry much traffic, and then you've got individual traffic beams. So you've got to look at the ratio between the wide broadcast signal and the narrow traffic beams. You need to look at the time domain duty factor um, because it's transmitting and receiving on the same frequency. It switches with time. And then you need to look at the um, uh, one thing that the network operators have is, of course, the, uh, um, you know, I, I guess the network load and the scheduler because it's going to schedule resources to different users. So there's a number of different factors that come in that are mentioned in the standard that you need to look at. And those references, there are references in the standard and some in your paper, uh, uh, Nicola, that uh, go through this. But I, I think it's probably fair to say that they're the three main factors, but it's probably worth having a look at those papers uh, I, we probably don't have enough time to go into it here, but I'm certainly happy to take it offline. Thank you, Mike, for responding to the question. I think that we've reached the end of this, uh, this session, and I would like to thank you, Nicola, for your participation, and Mike as well, and for sharing your insightful knowledge on this, uh, on this matter. So thank you once again, and Jack. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, thank you for those questions, both in the room and online. Um, I'll take over and just introduce our next speaker, Martin Fenton from Ofcom. He's the Director of Spectrum Policy. Uh, we were keen to have uh, Ofcom and Martin to speak at the event today because uh, Ofcom has gone through the exercise recently of adopting mandatory public limits uh, based on, well, the combination of ICNOR 2020 and ICNOR 98, I'm sure Martin will explain that. Uh, and Ofcom is also going through a consultation exercise around millimeter wave licensing for 5G. And we're interested to hear what was the level of public concern and interest in that topic? So, Martin, please share your experience. Thank you, Jack, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Jack said, I'm Martin Fenton. I'm a director in the Spectrum Group in, in Ofcom, which is about 100 yards that direction, so I don't have an excuse not to be here in person. But but it's a, it's a lovely office, so it's, it's great to be here. One of my responsibilities is our work on EMF compliance. Another is actually looking out, out for and, and working towards identifying new spectrum bands for mobile. Um, so I was intimately involved in the, the discussions at WRC 
19, which actually identified various millimeter wave bands for IMT, brackets 5G, and that in itself is a is a is a huge topic. Um, I must say, when we were discussing whether or not to identify certain millimeter wave bands for 5G, <coughs> EMF safety wasn't one of the considerations that was paid very much attention to. I'm afraid to say. Whether that's good or bad is, uh, you know, is open to question. But the the decisions were based around things like um, coexistence with existing services, um, rather than uh, the topic we're, we're discussing today. And as Jack says, we are we are currently going through the process following that WRC of working out how to make available, particularly two millimeter wave bands in the UK. That's the 26 gigahertz band and the 40 gigahertz band for 5G and other new uses. We consulted last on that back in May, that that consultation closed. We didn't ask any specific questions on EMF safety in that. We didn't actually make any proposals in regard to what we would specifically do for those bands in that consultation. But nonetheless, we did get quite a number of responses back on the topic of EMF safety. All of the, I think I say a number, we got 15. That's quite a lot for a for the sort of consultation we we put out on a particular topic like that. They were generally from members of the public or lobby groups, and they were all opposed to any use of millimeter wave for 5G public services. They largely relied on either just plain stating it's bad for you and therefore we shouldn't do it or pointing out particular studies people had found that seemed to purport the idea that it wasn't safe and therefore we shouldn't do something. But, but, you know, it's, it's very difficult to deal with those individually, those sort of responses to a consultation because you just end up with a, a, a ping pong of correspondence to and fro, whatever you say to try and placate them they won't accept and therefore our our approach to that is normally just to put something in the in the follow-up documentation that we put out usually a statement on decisions we've made just noting the concerns noting that uh, as I will explain now Ofcom isn't a health expert we rely on the health expertise of UK government agencies like the health security agency and we take their advice when we make spectrum decisions. Their advice to us is, as long as emissions comply with ICNERP, there isn't a problem. That's the gist of what they're saying to us anyway. And therefore, that's what we do. And so we just respond in, in, in that way rather than trying to enter into a, a correspondence with them because it will, it will inevitably go nowhere. Having said all of that and saying we didn't propose any specific EMF safety conditions, we will be putting at the point at which we make, we license the band and we issue licenses, we will be putting conditions in the license to require compliance with ICNERP general public limits. We, we first introduced conditions in all spectrum licenses that transmit above 10 watts EIRP in about May last year. That was a massive exercise of revising almost a quarter of a million licenses. And that's not just for, you know, obviously not just for for public cellular, every single license that Ofcom uh, issues for any type of use. So that goes from broadcasters to taxi firms, to radio amateurs, to fixed links, anybody who transmits with with a wireless telegraphy act license in the UK that authorizes them to transmit above 10 watts EIRP has to comply with the general public limits from IGNAP. We didn't specify in the license whether that was 98 or 2020, but we we put in the guidance document that we sit alongside that, our our guidance document and EMF compliance and enforcement. We, We put in there at the choice of the licensee, they can comply with either the 98 or the 2020 guidelines. We didn't go straight to 2020 because we were aware that there were no compliance standards available at the time. 
obviously the work on 62232 edition three was much earlier than then. It's good to know that that is now almost at the stage where it can be published. But nonetheless, the choice of which version of ICNRP licensees due to com- uh, choose to comply is down to the licensee. Um, as long as they can demonstrate that they comply, then, then we are happy for them to use whichever version they want. Um, and that will apply equally to the new millimeter wave licenses when we do award them in about a year or so's time. So that's, that's the position where we are at the moment. We're consulting on how to, how to make millimeter wave spectrum available for, for, for 5G services in the UK at the moment. We will intend to ensure that licensees have an obligation to comply with IGNO general public limits, and they can choose whether that's 98 or 2020. In terms of where we are learning so far from this process, and particularly around public cellular 5G, I think one of the key things, and it was touched on on earlier, is sharing of information between licensees who share a site. I think there is an issue there. It, it's not all, I mean, we get feedback from various parties, the licensees themselves, the site owners, and other parties who are involved in providing shared sites tell us that the, the sharing of inf- information necessary for people to do a compliance assessment isn't always, you know, that smooth. There's a you know, bit of friction there, reluctance to share information. That, that may be because the different parties don't want to reveal what they're doing on the site or they think there's some advantage to not sharing that information. They may be worried that regulators like Ofcom will come in if they start sharing information on a site basis and, and raise competition concerns and collusion concerns. And we've put out an, a number of frequently asked questions providing guidance to licensees on the measures they can do to ensure they can share information in a way that won't raise our concern, at least. But nonetheless, I think that's an area that needs further work, further analysis, and perhaps setting up some codes of practice or agreements amongst those parties involved in sharing sites to ensure that the, you know, the, the sharing of information happens effectively in a timely way so that people can you know, get on and, and do what they need to do. We've also carry out audit work. So we do measurements around um, mobile phone base stations to, to check for compliance with ignorant levels. We've been doing that for a number of years, going back to just after 2020, from the, the various generations of mobile technology. All of those measurement reports are on our website or, or can be accessed from our website. More recently, we've been focusing on measurements around 5G enabled sites in busy publicly accessible locations. So if we don't go and, and systematically measure emissions from every single base station in the UK. It's very much a sample approach. And the more recent ones we've done, we've been focusing on sites that have been recently upgraded to 5G and are close to busy public areas. And we take those measurements in those busy public areas. And the measurements always tell us that the the emission levels are a tiny fraction of of the requirements. And we will continue doing those measurements. We've got a program of engineers who go around. Typically, we're doing one, two, three measurements a week. There's been a bit of a backlog at the moment getting some of the latest results on our website, but hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be fully through our backlog. For this year, we'll have got um, about 150 sets of measurements published by the end of the year. We'll continue on for, for the foreseeable future, hopefully of the order of 150, 200 measurements around specific sites per year is, is, is the plan. So that's all I wanted to say. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Martin, for your remarks. Any questions in the room? So we've got a question at the front here. Thank you. Um, Sammy Gabriel from Vodafone Group. Martin, I just wanted to ask, sort of following on from the previous presentations, we've in the past had lots of comments that 5G signals are that difficult to measure, that we, we've we seen that measurements have been done in Italy. Have you had any problems measuring any types of the 5G technologies? I think the short answer is no. I think that the issue is when a technology is 
in the early phases of adoption, mm-hmm. it's not being utilised that heavily. Mm-hmm. And so you can go to an area and if there's nobody around you using the using that signal, you get some control channels. control channels, but you won't see the traffic channels there. And therefore, you have to wait around for a while before... You know, you know whether you've you've captured the, mm-hmm. uh, the signal channel as well as the control channel, and because we're not, we, we do it independently of the operator. You can never be a hundred percent sure what you've actually measured. All you can do is report what you actually measured on the day at the time you did the measurement. The plan will be to revisit some of the locations we've already measured in a year or so, when hopefully five G signals will be used much more. Than they are now, and and we will be able to assess, you know, what the difference is. But you know, there's in in the vast majority of cases, uh, there's a huge headroom in terms of what we've mm-hmm. measured and the limits. So yeah. we're not anticipating any problems, but but we will go back and remeasure. We are planning to do some more longer term measurements where we stay on a site for, you know, a lot longer. And so that, you know, we, we can hopefully capture the variation of the tra- as, as traffic ebbs and flows throughout the day. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Murray Romney, just following up on that last question, I, I, I've been looking at, at 5G base station measurements recently in, in some uh, studies, and I, I kind of came to the conclusion that measuring 5G signals is a bit like being asked to monitor road traffic, except you don't know where the roads are, and the roads also move. So basically, the, the the signal, the peak signal, is going to exist at the location where the user is, with some undefined uh, antenna gain on top of the control channels. So, given that that's the pr- signal that we're trying to measure and trying to verify, what techniques are currently being used in the UK to actually measure what that peak signal is, as opposed to other things which are easily measured, like the broadcast channels, or standing somewhere in hoping. Uh, what, what, what are you actually doing to, to get that peak signal? Well, so we can only measure what you can see at the time. So, so, so where we go is we go to busy locations where we think there's large footfall, a lot of people using their mobile phones, and we will stay there and we will monitor what, what the signal is. And then that gets reported back. We, as I said, we don't work with the the operators, we do our measurements independently, so we can only assess what we see. And, you know, all you, all you can do is ensure that you're in a location long enough to hopefully capture the, the peaks when the traffic channels are up and being used in the area you're in. And we're interested in busy areas, so hopefully that, that increases the probability that there will be a traffic channel up um, for somebody who's relatively close to the um, the location we're making the measurements from, but it's you know it's not guaranteed. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got one online question. I could just maybe comment on that. I think what we're hearing about is two different approaches. In some countries, they try to establish what the maximum theoretical value could be at a location. The Ofcom approach is to say this is the real world, yeah. what we measure at a location and what everybody would actually experience at that location. I guess it comes back a little bit to that actual maximum versus theoretical maximum discussion in the 6232 standard. But we'll do one online question. They have said that Ofcom has done many uh, measurements of sites. Have how many or any of the sites exceeded the public limit? No, none of them have ever exceeded the limit. I can't tell you how many off the top of my head because they go back an awful long time and the number we've done at any one time has varied due to various issues where where at some point we're more interested or or the you know sometimes the public concern raises and so we we respond to that by doing more measurements in in particular times but it's got to be several thousand probably three four five thousand measurements over the last 20 years more recently We've probably measured around 200, 250 measurements specifically around 5G base stations. Thank you, Martin, for for that remarks and for sharing the experience of the UK. So we'll turn the the next session over to our second panel. This one to be chaired by Martin Busch from uh, Deutsche Telekom. He's also vice chair of the GSMA EMF and Health Group. We've got, this is a hybrid panel in a hybrid event. 
So we're going to have Martin and Sarah, if you can join us at the, the table at the front. And there's a couple of online speakers in trying to have as much geographic just diversity as well in the event. So I'll let Martin introduce the rest of the speakers. Well, thank you very much, Jack. And I would like to welcome you to this second panel discussion of the day. And as you mentioned, it is a truly hybrid session, and I hope it, everything will work. In this panel discussion, we have will be addressing the harmonization of RF EMF uh, limits and the compliance assessment approaches. And we got some very interesting insights from Martin Fenton already on Ofcom, how they've been dealing with these issues. And furthermore, we would like to address the small cell deployments and further 4G, 5G network deployment. And last but not least, we also will address communication aspects and approaches to improve public confidence. So the overarching questions will be what policies are needed um, for further deployment of mobile networks with changing demands and what role does communication play in these context. So we already uh, welcomed Martin Fenton, so thank you very much for your introductory statement. Here in London, we also have Sarah Wiley, um, EMF manager of the Vodafone Group and also chair of the GSMA Global EMF and Health Group. Joining us from Canada, we are glad to welcome Josette Galant. She's a senior director for Terrestrial Engineering and Standards at the Federal Canadian Institution, ISET, which stands for Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada. Hello, Josette. Good to see you. And we also will be joined by Dr. Alberto Najera, who is an associate professor at the University of Castilla-La Mancha and a coordinator of the Scientific Advisory Committee on Radiation, Radio Frequencies and Health in Spain. Hello, Alberto, good to see you. So we um, had uh, an initial statement by Martin Fenton so far and a very lively discussion. So I hope we can keep this up. And uh, now I would like to ask Josette to speak about her work at ISAT Canada to give a initial statement. So I'm handing over you, to you, Josette. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. So thank you for the kind introduction. And I would also like to thank the uh, GSME organizing committee for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, so since this is the first time that I said uh, does present uh, on the GSME EMF event, I think it would be quite suited to provide an overview of the RF uh, exposure activities uh, in Canada. Uh, so I'll first start by mentioning there are two main federal departments that are responsible for RF exposure activities. Uh, the first one being Health Canada. Uh, Health Canada is the Canadian federal institution uh, that is responsible for promoting uh, the health of Canadians and as such uh, they are responsible for developing the, uh, the RF exposure limit from 3, 3 kilohertz to 300 uh, gigahertz. These limits are found in a document that is entitled uh, Safety Code 6 uh, Guidelines. In uh, this uh, guideline documents, uh, the limits are to protect against two uh, health effects. The first one being nerve stimulation below 30 megahertz, and the other one being uh, the thermal effects from 100 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. Uh, the second department is my department, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, or ISET for short. Uh, some people may know us under Industry Canada before uh, 2015. So we are uh, the uh, spectrum regulator in uh, Canada, and as such, we've adopted Health Canada Safety Code 6 limit as part of our spectrum management regulations for device as well as for radio communication installations. Uh, when it comes to wireless device, uh, a manufacturer of wireless products must demonstrate that they meet Health Canada Safety Code 6 limit as part of ISED's uh, certification program. So this is needed before they are able to sell the products on the Canadian market. And uh, compliance to these limits are an ongoing obligation. So I said as part of our regulatory activities, we've actually implemented a market surveillance program where we will go and test different products on the Canadian market to ensure that they continue to uh, comply with all applicable technical standards, including the RF exposure requirements. Uh, we've 
also adopted Health Canada Safety Code 6 limits as part of our conditions of license of radio communication installation for radio communication installation operators. So an operator uh, such as a mobile network operator must also comply with Safety Code 6 at all times. And they must take into account not just their uh, radio communication installation, they must also take into account the nearby installation uh, in the local radio environment when determining compliance to Safety Code 6. Uh, so similar to our market surveillance program, we also have an audit program where we will go and test different uh, or audit different installation to ensure that they continue to comply with Safety Code 6 limits. Now, I'll touch on the compliance procedures. When it comes to ICED, we actively participate in the International Electrotechnical Commission or the IEC uh, Technical Committee 106. So for those familiar with the IEC TC 106, they develop a slew of uh, international standard technical reports as well as publicly available specification related to RF exposure uh, assessment. So within our domestic procedures, we've actually adopted some of those IEC TC 106 uh, documents, either in part or in its totality. In some cases, we've actually gone out with our own domestic procedure ahead of those international standards, just to ensure that products are able to enter the Canadian market in a timely fashion and to provide guidance to, uh, main, especially for wireless manufacturers on the RF exposure assessment. So in those cases, we will actually share our documents with the IECTC 106 committee in order to support the international development of uh, standardized procedures. So I'll finish off with the uh, communication piece. So uh, I said, as well as uh, Health Canada, we do publish uh, uh, some communication product, mainly for the general public. So we do try to use plain language when we do explain uh, the compliance procedure for device uh, installation and also uh, the limits. And when in um, on ISET's webpage, uh, we do have a RF safety webpage, we call it, and we do see it as a live document. So when we do get questions that are quite often, that we often receive them, then we can basically uh, amend our webpage and then provide uh, further um, information on this particular question. And an example would be the misinformation that we were getting from 5G and COVID-19 or 5G and the increased risk of cancer that we were seeing in social media and on the internet. So we did address the, these issues uh, on our webpage. In the case of Health Canada, they also published uh, some communication product, as I mentioned. They actually released a, a video on the safety of 5G technology and, and the limits. So I'll stop there and I'll pass it back to you, uh, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much for these insight on the work you do at ISET. We'll come back to that later. And I would like to ask uh, Alberto Njajera for his initial statement uh, on his work at uh, SARS in Spain. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to share with you this panel discussion. And I would like to thank the GSMN for considering the Spanish Scientific Advisory Committee on Radio Frequency and Health the CCARS. Let me introduce what it is and what we do in this committee of independent experts. Until 1999, there was no agency, body or institution in Spain that was concerned from a scientific perspective with studying and disseminating knowledge about the possible effects of radio frequency on health. In that year, Dr. Francisco Vargas, Deputy Director of Environmental and Occupational Health of the Ministry of Health, convened a group of professors and researchers and created the Committee of Experts on Non-Ionizing Radiation. The mission of this expert committee was to advise the Ministry of Health and other institutions on strategies for the protection of the public from environmental non-ionizing radiation critically uh, reviewing the scientific evidence and drafting a document with conclusions and recommendations for the control of and limiting the public exposure. 
after different comp configuration and institutions involved, the C cars now depends since 20 from since the year 2016 on the official College of Telecommunications Engineering that took over the manage the management of the committee, which renewed its structure and composition. The committee uh, currently has 10 scientific members, including doctors, engineers and physicists. The committee produced position papers and triennial reports in which we review the scientific evidence. The last one was presented in the year 2020 and uh, evaluated the scientific evidence published between the years 2016 and 2019. So we'll so we will soon be working on the next report where risk communication is also an important part of its objectives. One of the objectives of the CCARS is to disseminate this information and bring it closer to the society. For this reason, the reports published are disseminated through the media, social networks and our own website. In addition, we keep a close eye to new developments, news or concerns in society in order to prepare this position paper and clarifications. An important part of the activity we are developing is the, is the collaboration with agencies that verify access and fake news. This activity uh, intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic and since the, the year 2020, more than 50 fake news have been debunked in collaboration with these uh, verification agencies, which have been shared by national and international media, especially by Spanish speaking media in Spain, but also in Latin America. Every development of a new technology has been accompanied by a resistant movement. Today, with the 5G generation, they have taken advantage of the test of COVID-19 to add more fear and more misinformation but with the same arguments and warnings as they used 30 years ago. Also, more recently, the CCARS have published a comment to a paper, a scientific paper, that, as Martin Rosley pointed out in the previous panel, are common in peer-reviewed journals. Papers of very low quality that are used by this anti-antenna movements and that in some cases are disseminated by the media for their social appeal. Contributing to an informed disinformation, but very low scientific quality. We could also talk about the responsibility of these scientific papers, uh, as I said, of very low quality, and the dissemination not only by media, but also by some institutions. This shows uh, a false polar polarization of the current scientific consensus on possible effects and further increases fear. We must not forget that fake news is not only intent to spread a lie, but also to make people doubt the truth. And these low quality papers provoke these doubts in high quality science. Thank you, Alberto, for these insights into the communication problems and issues you're dealing with. And before we start the discussion, I would like to give the word to Sarah. Uh, for an introductory statement about the EMF challenges of an operator. Do you want to sit there or speak from there? Yeah. Okay. It's better, yeah. <laughs> um, I was really interested to hear the comments of Alberto there about misinformation. This is something that as an industry we face all the time, the, the, the real life impact of that misinformation. Um, and I wanted to give you an example of a place where they've, they've had some success in encountering this. In South Africa recently, they spent a long time because they noticed that communication, they understood that communication is not just talking, but also listening. They spent time with a particular group who were opposed to putting up radio antennas. They put together a team. They went and listened to the concerns that were expressed. They discovered that this population was affluent, that there had been a lot of vocal activists, that public participation process was just failing. Um, and as a result, there were no new coverage sites in that area for the, up to five years. So, of course, impacting the rollout of, of new technologies. So they put in a solution on what they called regional end-to-end -end community engagement strategy. 
is a long way of saying they went they went and spent time with people. They listened and they got to know people. Um, they engaged on social media. They had neighborhood ambassadors. Um, they were representing the entire community and they persevered and they were very transparent about the plans. We've heard um, earlier on today about transparency. And I think when you get down to talking to the real people who are receiving this misinformation, transparency from, from us as industry with the support of regulators and academics like we've heard today can play a really important role. Certainly, they've seen some success. They've now been able to build the first site in many years. There's still continuing resistance, but they have some plans in, in the pipeline. So that's just um, a single example from, from one operator in one market and their response to the misinformation problems. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Sarah. So I think from these initial statements, we hear that there are many different aspects uh, which affect the deployment of, uh, of mobile networks. And um, I would like to structure a little bit the discussion and start with the policy framework. And then I'm looking over to you, Martin. We heard that the limits, I think, are one very important aspect. And uh, before we heard from Professor Samaras that the, uh, the, the recommendation to update the European regulations to uh, 20, ICNIP 2020 as soon as possible Think that's that's very interesting and um, you also mentioned the approach uh, Ofcom has been uh, taken uh, to to give a choice between 1998 and 2020 so um, how would you advise because we are a very international panel here and we have Canada here we have Spain and we have uh, Vodafone as a very international operator how would you advise other countries that are considering the adoption of the ICNIP 2020 limits uh, what would you say to that it's an interesting question, and I don't think there's a, a simple answer to that. It depends. I, I, th I think what you need to ensure that there's there's ways for people to comply, so the availability of relevant standards mm -hmm. that can demonstrate compliance is very important. The approach, as I outlined, that we took in Ofcom was to give people the choice, but make it very clear that whatever they do, they need to be able to demonstrate how they comply. In the absence of a standard, that can be quite difficult. Hence, people may choose to uh, adopt the 98 limits pending the availability of the, the, the standard and then the expertise necessary to apply it. Mm. We didn't think in the UK's point of view that we, we wanted to mandate 20, 2020, but give that, that choice to, to licensees. Uh, whether that works in other particular countries, I think, depends on the regulatory environment in those countries. But certainly that's the pro approach we, we picked at some stage, and, and we have no time scale in mind for this, but at some stage, stage we will drop 98 from the condition, mm -hmm. but we won't do that until we are satisfied that the, the compliance process for 2020 is working effectively and people need know what they need to do. Mm. Once we are satisfied, then then we will we'll bring pro proposals forward to uh, drop 98 and uh, is our normal processes we consult, we consider and then make a decision. Mm. Um, but we have no plans to do that in the foreseeable future, but, but, but maybe in a few, few years time we might. You mentioned before with the changing demands of mobile networks, not only the limits are important, it's also about how to measure the compliance and you, you explained a lot uh, how Ofcom is dealing with that. And maybe if I would uh, ask you, that Canada is one of the countries which has implemented the new IEC 62232 approach to assess RF EMF compliance. Could you also explain the benefits and why should other countries follow Canada's example? Maybe you can share some insights on that. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. So as I mentioned in my opening uh, remarks, uh, I said does participate actively in the IEC TC106 uh, subcommittees, including the MT3, the Maintenance Stream uh, 3, uh, which is responsible for developing the IEC 62232. I said was actually the group that actually um, led the um, the ad hoc group when it came to the development of the validation procedures for uh, the uh, the control and the monitoring mechanism in the actual MAX approach. So ahead of actually the IEC 62232 being published in a few months, I guess now, 
uh, last fall, we actually opened our uh, domestic procedures for um, assessing uh, radio communication installations, where we introduced the actual maximum approach as a, a method that could be used by our mobile network operators. But before using this approach, they must demonstrate to the department that they've implemented the uh, this power uh, mechanism uh, accordingly through uh, the validation procedure that was that was developed through the IEC. Now, uh, in terms of the benefit of using this approach, uh, I would say that it is more of a realistic approach compared to using the theoretical maximum uh, power level. So it does provide a, a better um, well, a realistic overview of the compliance boundary compared to using the, the theoretical max uh, value. Now, in terms of if other countries should be using this approach, uh, I won't be you know, preaching in terms of what other countries should be doing. But I, I will say that when it comes to, uh, to I said, uh, if we do see those uh, novel approaches or the novel technology, what we will typically do is make sure that they're robust. So we will often test them in our laboratory and try to break them. And when we're uh, comfortable with the uh, these novel approach and technology, we will make the uh, proper amendment in our, uh, in our technical rules so that they can be used in Canada uh, by Canadians and also to ensure that they're safe for, uh, for Canadians to use. Thank you, Martin. I'll pass it back to you. Absolutely, absolutely agree. It's not it's not about preaching. It's about listening and learning. And uh, I think that's what we can we can do at this panel. And um, absolutely. So the, you also mentioned um, millimeter wave licensing. I think uh, Martin, you 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 said before uh, mentioned this issue and especially the public consultation and um, that concerns have been expressed. So how do you approach this issue? You mentioned that you will be relevant next year, uh, probably. And um, is there something special when it comes to um, public communication on this issue? Because uh, this seems to be new for many people. And uh, obviously, there are many fears around this, this issue. Uh, yes. And in terms of the, the approach, and fundamentally, I don't think it'll be any different to mm. other, other bands. I think what we what we need to consider is whether there's a need for any um, specific information alongside um, the you know alongside the award of the spectrum mm. to address public concerns, and the level of public concern uh, goes up and down, and therefore we have to calibrate our own work in terms of providing information based on what we're seeing at the time. So at the moment, we haven't got any specific plans about any sort of information campaign mm -hmm. associated with EMF alongside the award, but it's something we'll keep an eye on. Okay. We have in the past produced various bits of information, um, leaflets, and, and, mm -hmm. and gone and spoken at, at various events to try and um, allay public concerns and and we may we may decide to do the same but at the moment i can't say exactly what we will or right. won't do in that regard but it's something that we we keep you know mm. we keep in the back of our mind as to, okay. to whether you know we we need to do something specific in terms of providing further reassurance or or, or information to the public i can ask more questions but if there are some questions from the audience i'm happy to take them and I just maybe while you prepare, you have a question over there. Yes, please. <laughs> um, it seems to me that that the industry has always been behind the curve on this business. Um, 2G came, and then there was a lot of investigation, mm -hmm. and then 3G came, and then there was a lot of investigation, and even with 4G and 5G, <laughs> we didn't see before introducing the standards that there should have been information out there with the public. It seems to me that, that it's always a catch up. Now, there has been work done on millimeter wave, and I would have thought there's a great necessity to get that out in the public before we start introducing the, the base stations. Does somebody want to respond to this? Uh, yes, I'm yeah. happy to respond. Thanks, um, Sarah. And I think you're right. I think it's a really good point. We need to hear that um, perhaps the people who communicate about EMF need to be as quick off the mark as the people who market the benefits of 5G. I think that's a, that's a fair point. What I would say is that we certainly uh, at 
at Vodafone and across the industry and the GSMA have really welcomed that ICNA of 2020 came out when it did with a very clear message about 5G. So it's, an, it's a message that we have been able to pick up and continue. I think it's also fair to say that there are a lot of schools of thought that say that to, to go out and talk about it's safe, don't worry, when nobody was worried is perhaps not the best approach either. Uh, Murray Romney, just following up on that, you know, what's the next scale going to be? And we've mentioned millimeter wave here. Uh, it took a whole different game, millimeter wave. And I'm particularly interested in how customer premises equipment, uh, fixed wireless access devices are going to be managed and also the actual uh, user devices. Some time ago, the FCC type approved a 53 dBm desktop fixed wireless access device, which from my calculations, violated the ICNAP limits at a distance of one meter. And this thing was designed to go on a tabletop. And I don't know how they got that through. And they did actually measure that level of power. I saw the I saw the lab report. So I, I'm just wondering, when is that going to start to become a concern? Uh, because these devices are not, unlike you, you mentioned about the, you know, the statistical nature of the, the you know, the field-based measurements, that's fine. But when you get into the area of fixed wireless access, you're you're basically sitting at this thing all day. And potentially it could be, you know, you could be in uh, getting a, a direct beam from a, a, a very local base station, or you could have a fixed wireless access device right next to where you are. I'm just wondering when is that going to start to get talked about? And then linked to that is the actual radiation off the devices themselves, which are hi highly complicated things to measure and they're highly interactive. Uh, when you approach a millimeter wave device, put your finger on the antenna, you will violate the ignore limits and therefore the phone needs to detect that and power down. There's a whole bunch of issues around, around the beam steering aspects of millimeter wave. So I think that could be the next thing that hasn't, I've not seen that as being a, a major issue yet, but it could become one in the near future uh, as millimeter wave starts to become more of a, a real thing. If none of the panel want to respond on that, first I'll give that opportunity. Millimeter wave 5G is a reality today in the United States. You can get devices. And the IEC has recently published the compliance testing procedures for millimeter wave devices. And, and your concern about wi access points, we've seen similar concerns around Wi-Fi access points. But we know from measurements done by Public Health England and by other groups that uh, the access points maximum time duty cycle is about 10% for individual devices, about 1% or less. So we would expect to see something similar. And because of the even higher data rates with 5G, some of the measurements show that the, the transmission time is very short. And so again, that reduces the exposure. And we do know because there was data published, I think last year at BioEM, that millimeter wave 5G devices operated about the same level as 4G devices or 5G midband devices at typically 1% to 3% uh, of the, the maximum exposure limit. 53 dBm EIRP, that's 300 and something watts. It's, it's like orders of magnitude bigger than Wi-Fi. Look, it would depend on how it's tested. So you can do com com testing based on exposure or free field limits, or you can do testing based on SAR, depending on the type of installation and how close to the body it is. And that can make a big difference in how it's compliant. And it's also not just a peak value, as was mentioned earlier. The limits are based on time averaging. Thanks. Sorry. No, thank you very much. In the UK, what we do is we have a condition in licenses, but we also have lots of exempt devices as well. Um, and at the moment, we haven't put any conditions in our license exemption regulations dealing with EMF safety, largely because that's that's an issue which uh, which is dealt with in the, um, the the compliance requirements for devices under the radio equipment um, regulations, which include requirements for assessing against uh, EMF issues. However, when we make decisions in a regulator like Ofcom about whether are we are going to include a category of device within our license exemption regulations. We take into account the EMF issues, and we have in the past decided not to exempt certain categories of equipment, but require an individual license, which allows us to put greater controls in place to ensure that they, they do comply. So it's something we, we consider, and we, you know, it, it can affect how we how we make decisions about whether we authorize on a exempt basis or 
a live license or individual licensing um, so that we can ensure that the relevant uh, requirements are, are best complied with. Well, thank you very much. Maybe I'll give uh, Sammy Gabriel the chance to comment on this as well, and then I would like to ask Alberto uh, some questions because he hadn't had the chance to speak. So, uh, Sammy, please. Uh, thank you, Mark. I've got two, two comments, really. Firstly, with regards to millimetre wave, we're, we're talking about it a lot now, really, because of the use cases. And I wanted just to separate out the technology and the use cases. The technology of using microwave for fixed uh, access is very old. We've mm. been using it for many, many years without issue. So this isn't new technology, but we're applying it to a much newer use case. So that's the only difference here. So there aren't, for example, newer health uh, issues. There aren't newer standards applicable. It is just applying those existing standards to the use cases that we're coming up with. Mm. The other thing um, with regards to the application and uh, just picking up from something that Josette uh, said earlier, having the, the diversity of participants in the standardization work and groups like the, the ICED who will take a standard, they will participate in the development of it, but then they also go back to their labs and I think if I quote her correctly, try to break that standard as well. It is that test of robustness of the standards that actually adds value to them and gives us a, a more acceptable standard. So uh, I'd just like to thank them for the work that they're doing there as well. All right. Thank you, Sammy. Looking at Alberta, I think I would like to come back to your initial statement. You mentioned that you have a lot of experience regarding risk communication, and especially in different parts of the world, in Latin America and in Spain. What I find very interesting is that you also use social media um, as part of your risk communication, um, which we see kind of being kind of unusual because in some countries we had bad experience because um, a factual um, discussion on social media seems difficult in some cases. So maybe you can uh, elaborate on this and other differences uh, when you look at uh, different parts of the world, um, how, how the risk communication works. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, thanks, Mary. It's uh, difficult to participate in a discussion remotely. Uh, since, I'm, since I joined the CCARS, my personal perception is, at least in Spain, it's that uh, these anti-antenna movements are calm, but the most important is that its presence in media has been reduced. In Spain, we have a national association for the social communications of, of science and a national network of scientific culture and scientific dissemination units that now work collaboratively with media. Uh, I am the coordinator of that unit in my university. Many media contact, contact us uh, before publishing news that could be sensitive or misinterpret. Also, my perception in Latin America is that there is a lack in this issue, but some media have started to contact, to contact uh, CCARS in some cases. Most alerts uh, of these anti-antenna movements now comes from Latin America, where media is still focus, focusing in their advice with no evidence instead of contact any scientific expert. I love Samara when he said uh, that firstly, we have to define what is an expert. <laughs> and about social media, in my opinion, if we are not in social media, others will be. Our presence in, in this media, in the media and the social networks, exposes us, but allows us to offer di direct treatment and to communicate to communicate uh, scientific evidence with rigor and to respond to false science. I have even received uh, death threats uh, and many insults, but sometimes with patience and with empathy, I have been able to argue with people. In other cases, it is impossible. But in any case, there are many people watching and reading, and my perception is most of them have more common sense and perceive the lies are, uh, of those who pretend to misinform or warn about uh, without any evidence. So I think we must be in, in social media we, because the people is in the social media and we have to work uh, together with media, with, uh, the, with the journalists. And this 
to the association and the network of good uh, scientific culture that we have in Spain. I think it's a very good two things that some countries yeah. would, uh, have to, to develop because uh, we are working together and uh, the, the results are out there. Thanks. I'm looking over to Jack. Do you have another question from the audience or from yeah, the chat? Yeah, we've got, we've got one question from online. It's, uh, it's actually directed to, to Martin Fenton, but I'm going to modify it and maybe it's some other members of the panel might like to, to respond to it as well. So the, the question is that looking at the Ofcom situation where you can choose ICNOP 98 or ICNOP 2020, is there a, a risk of a perception that if you choose the older standard, you're choosing a less safe standard versus going with the new standard? And is this something we're also going to see more broadly with countries if they don't update to the latest international guidelines, are they going to look like their their safety approach is old and outdated? So maybe Martin to start and, and if anybody else would like to come in on that. I guess there is a risk there. I haven't experienced any anything that tells me that, that that's that's something that, that partic people have particularly raised at this stage with us, certainly. There is a risk and and I guess that will factor into the eventual decision we would make at the point we we decide to withdraw the uh, the 98 guidelines from our requirements, um, but it's not something I'm seeing particularly at the moment. I think a lot of larger organisations are looking at 2020 and deciding that that's probably the way they want to go because it you know it it, it enables them to say we're taking into account the the latest version. But, but it's not something at this this time that we think we need to um, particularly mandate. The, the health authorities in the UK, uh, the Health Security Agency, um, hasn't updated its guidance to point to 2020. And that's that's the primary source we go for in, in Ofcom when we're making decisions about whether it should be 98 or 2020. If the Health Security Agency, the UK Health Security Agency, changed its advice, then we would certainly take action. Thank you. Yeah, we have to wrap it up. And so I would like to thank all the speakers of this panel. Um, thank you, Josette. Thank you, Alberto. I think it's worked very well to have this hybrid panel. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Martin. It was great having you here. And then I would like to hand over to Jack and Sarah for the final remarks of this uh, event today. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for facilitating that, that panel. This is the, the last section of the day where we try and, between Sarah and myself, bring together some maybe some thoughts that we've taken from the day. Uh, please do add to them if uh, you think we something we've missed. Before we start to speak, just to point out that the uh, feedback survey on the event is available online now. The, you've got the QR code on your desk. Uh, my colleagues are posting it in the chat for those who are online. Please do fill it in. Uh, we do look at those surveys. Uh, for example, the response last year told us we needed to modify our balance between speakers and panels. And so we've tried to take that account this year. And so anything you do suggest, we will think about for, for design for the next event. Uh, so I'm going to try and summarize uh, session one. I think we were all interested to see the timing the WHO would reveal in terms of the risk assessment process, uh, as Dr. Van der Venter said. 1993 was the last time WHO looked at this topic. If you look at that document, you see no mention of mobile phones or mobile communication. So this is really a once in a generation opportunity for WHO to do such a comprehensive review. Uh, it's a very structured approach as we heard, so we should start to see some of the systematic reviews towards the end of this year, technical report next year, the task group meeting and the environmental health criteria document towards the end of next year. Uh, and we all hope that the WHO can uh, can meet that timetable. I think this is, this is a really critical time for governments. We often see questions about credibility of guidelines, for example, from ICNR. It's not a familiar organization from the health point of view to many governments, whereas WHO is. And for WHO to make a clear statement will, I think, help governments, and I hope particularly governments in countries with restrictive limits to maybe relook at, at the, those limits. Uh, we also heard from uh, Theo Samaras about the progress of the SHARE 
preliminary opinion. I felt like as GSMA, I should apologize to, to Theo because uh, GSMA put quite a few comments in during the public consultation process, which means he might be working Christmas Day <laughs> developing responses, it, it sounds like. So, uh, but again, that is critical. We, we do hope to see that out as soon as possible, as Theo said, uh, and then that will start the legislative process within Europe. Clearly, because of uh, legal responsibilities, member states don't have to wait. They have the competency to set public exposure limits for EMF, so they can do that now. Uh, and so that there's no reason to wait for that process, though we can understand why some will need to do that. And outside of Europe, there, there are many countries that have still to start that process of moving to ICNAR 2020. I thought it was um, interesting from Martin Rosley's presentation, quality, quality, quality. Uh, I think he mentioned that word multiple times and the fact that we're more likely to see positive results from low quality studies. And I think that's that's one of the questions was, how do we, do we overcome that issue with low quality studies? That's a challenge. Uh, as Martin said, part of it is the challenge of funding. Part of it is more broadly the, the challenge of the, the journals process and you can get low quality papers funded. I think it helps that organizations like SHARE list the papers that are uninformative. And so hopefully from a research point of view, you would not want to do a study that's going to be uninformative for the decision making by health agencies. And I think that's an, ex an element of transparency that we've seen in uh, reports from health agencies in the last few years that's, that's quite interesting and quite evident, helpful. Sarah Lochran from Australia didn't get a lot of time to talk about risk communication, but I would say that our PANS has really radically changed how they do risk communication. Uh, they went from very text-heavy documents to very social media-friendly graphics and very clear statements. And it does seem to, I live in Australia, so I see this locally, it does seem to cut through in terms of something that on the social media works well, in more traditional media as well. And so I think it's, it's something that we've taken on board at GSMA as well. We've tried to reduce the word count in our documents, including our notice uh, millimeter wave document. We've tried to do much more graphical type approach and work, working on infographic type approaches. There, what did you take away from the second session? I mean, it was it was exciting actually to be in the room together, wasn't it? Before, before we think about the details of the session, I think it was bold that I wasn't part of the steering group putting this together, but but I'm part of the I'm heading up the working group. And and each time, you know, we were hearing about the forum, we were hearing, we were thinking about the content, we were thinking about the participants and the panelists with great care and, and thank you to all of you for putting in all that work. But I think we all forgot what it would feel like to walk in the room and shake someone's hand and to share a coffee and to discuss these issues together. So really appreciate making it hybrid, really appreciate bringing some of us back in the room and who knows what will happen 12 months from now, but it's been good today. And thank you for those online for persevering because I don't know. I'd be interested in the feedback to know what it's like to feedback, you know, to, to experience this remotely. You know, Sarah talked about, um, I know Alberto talked about it's difficult to be part of a panel when some are in the room. So, you know, a challenge, but we rose to it and, and it's been good. So, yes, to, to the content, I really enjoyed hearing a bit more about IEC 62232. This is this is something I'm told about by my colleagues, but it's not the area I work in. My EMF interest is more on the policy and the communication side. So I found that really helpful to hear about it from Mike and then to have the specifics from Nicola about the power monitoring and control mechanism and all the research that you've done in Naples. Did you know that Naples University is 800 years old? I really hope they haven't been researching EMF all those years. <laughs> So I found that really helpful and, and also the reassurance about the performance not being impacted. Because certainly when, when I tell non-experts about this um, control feature, the immediate response by radio engineers is, well, what's it doing to the performance and by marketeers? What's it doing to our customers? So this was really helpful to have that get presented to us. I was struck by the, the news from the UK. I, I, I sit in the UK, but I work, have a global role, so I wasn't so up to date with Ofcom as some of my colleagues. So the fact that, that here in the UK, there's this choice to comply, I really like that. I thought that was quite a, a new approach. You know, 
we'd seen our Panza introduced 2020. Um, we've seen other countries introduced. We've seen others waiting to see. And of course, we're following the EU and seeing what they do. But to hear of a country that said, yeah, let's let's give the operators the choice, um, that was interesting for me. Just on that point, Sarah, there was an, a recent paper that found that if you comply with ICNOP 98 for base stations, you comply for ICNOP 2020 for base stations. Yeah. When you consider all the nuances that are in the new guidelines. So from an existing network's point of view, that seems to indicate that it won't be a big impact in terms of the existing infrastructure yeah. moving forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we couldn't get away from COVID. We thought we might, but we didn't. And it was the um, Josette from Canada who talked about the impact of um, COVID and 5G and their need to kind of come out hard and fast and simple with some messages about 5G and COVID back, back in 2020. And that was a good reminder that that's what we've had, to, we've, we've faced over the last couple of years and the real need to, to keep those messages, you know, learn what we did from COVID. So keep the messages simple, keep them in time um, and, and keep them very clear. Uh, and certainly in the industry, we rely on those messages coming from people like Health Canada and IESD, IES, IFED, Josette's um, organization. So yeah, those are some of the things that, I, that I've taken away. I think just would add, in a day like today, of course, we, fa we focus on the standards and I'm really glad that we have. Of course, we focus on some of the specifics about 5G technology and millimeter waves. But we all in this room need to remember, I would say a couple of things. One, that, you know, certainly in the European Commission, they have a, an ambitious goal for 5G across all the European footprint and governments all across the world are keen to adopt and to give their citizens more access to 5G. So we need to remember that that's what we're trying to get to. And this existence in some countries of different standards and non-harmonised limits is actually delaying those ambitious goals. They don't need to be that ambitious. If the, if the standards were simpler and harmonised, things could be done much more quickly. So that's the kind of pitch. But let me tell you a story about what this means in reality. I have a friend in the town that I live in in the UK. She's arrived in this country with nothing. And when I say with nothing, she arrived in flip-flops. She lives in a, in a temporary accommodation. She cooks the food that she loves in the kitchens of friends. Her clothes all are donated, but she has a phone. And because she has a phone, she can, internet permitting, she can speak to her children who are in another country. Because she has a phone, when somebody gets her a place at college to learn English, she has a map. She doesn't have money for the bus, but her phone, because of a charitable access to free data, gives her the route. So she doesn't get lost in this strange town where she doesn't speak the language. And because she has a phone, she can go online and learn English to accelerate her chances in the future when she's permitted to work of a job. And that, I would say, is why we're here, because we want mobile and 5G not to be the preserve of the already wealthy, the already employed, the already educated, but actually the, the preserve of the people who are looking to expand their opportunities, to expand their horizons and to develop new skills. That's what I thought of the second section. <laughs> Very inspirational, Sarah. <laughs> um, I think it, it's probably coming to the point where we should be wrapping up, do you think? Well, I can see the lunch, so yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> and, the, and we all already heard the pastries are great, so the lunch will certainly meet that standard. Just uh, a few administrative things. So where speakers allow us to, we will be sharing presentations and other materials uh, after the event. Give us a, a, probably a couple of weeks to get everything sorted and, and distributed so you get it in, all in one batch. I want to pick up on uh, something that Sarah said about thanking the organizing committee. Uh, it has been about nine months work by the organizing committee. Uh, we will have a discussion tomorrow about today, which means we'll start to think about what next year's <laughs> event might look like. Uh, so again, please do fill in that survey. Uh, in respect to the organizing committee and the, the impacts of COVID, there's a couple of people mm. who can't be with us today because they've come down with COVID in the last uh, few hours and so couldn't travel. Uh, Josette from Canada presented remotely, even though she also has been suffering COVID symptoms for the last few days. And I really appreciate her getting mm. up at 6 a.m. To, to, to participate in the event. 
I also want to thank my colleagues at GSMA who have helped to put together all the, the materials and the venue and have managed the online and offline presentations. I think what I need to finish with is a call to action. So what I would say to, to policymakers and others participating here and online, monitor the WHO review process. That is going to be the comprehensive reference point for, for the scientific part, the risk assessment. Look at ICNOC 2020. That's your current best guidance for the risk management part and consider the adoption and update the compliance rules uh, according to the IAC 6232 standard that allows the proper and efficient deployment of 5G and not just 5G because some of those methods can be applied to 4G and other antennas. But there is, as, uh, as Daniel Pataki said in, at the start of the event from GSMA, this is, we see a time of transition. We would like to see that momentum continue. So as Sarah said, deployment can be efficient and people can benefit from the services. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with that, I'll call, call the event closed. For those of you who are online, thank you very much for your participation. For those in the room, enjoy the lunch.